Welcome back to the Name Redacted Podcast, America's most beloved podcast, the most downloaded Red Sox podcast in the world. I am pleased to announce this is the third straight episode that we are joined by none other than Patrick James Light, former first rounder of the motherfucking Boston Red Sox. I heard Will Fleming absolutely bodied you, Pat. Yeah, let's uh, let's get right into that. <laughs> um, I didn't think that we were going to get here immediately. I'm glad you brought it up, Tyler. Uh, here it is. Stephen Piscotti, Mitch Hanniger, Joey Gallo, Lance McCullers, who's in the minor leagues today doing a rehab, Matt Olson. That is absolutely absurd. Patrick Wisdom. Here's another foul ball by Sanchez, and it's 0-2. Jesse Winker. <laughs> what was going, in the right? water in 2012? And of course, the Red Sox in that year not only took Devin Marrero, but Pat Light and Brian Johnson. So in a talent-rich draft, you'd have to say the Red Sox did not take advantage. <laughs> o2. <laughs> the O2. Damn, dude. Cold. That's cold. Damn, you got flamed by Will Fleming right there. Well, Who's a listener? He's a listener of the show. So if you have anything uh, that you'd like to say, Pat, to uh, to those statements, I mean, like that feels, that feels, uh, it, it, it hurt me. It hurt me to, to hear that. Someone making fun of your career like that. Well, listen, listen, <laughs> I have a text message from Will Fleming. Post this comment. <laughs> well, probably because... Uh, when you're doing like a what's today Wednesday? Yeah, yeah. When you're doing a Wednesday, two o'clock Red Sox game, you're probably sitting there thinking like, no one's fucking listening to this. No one's listening to this right now. People are busy. They've got kids. They've got families. They've got jobs. And then I'm sure he probably saw the tweets. Like here, here come the tweets. People are like, oh fuck, um, Pat's gonna hear about this. So he, so he got out in front of this. He did. Uh, he lied. Uh, but. <laughs> <laughs> what did he say? I will say he he, he it's a lie by omission. He, okay. he he told the truth of things he said, but he forgot mm-hmm. that last part he said. Um, what was the last? Part? That was the first time you heard that audio. Second time I did hear. Second I, time, yeah, I did. Someone sent it. Well, actually, I had sent it a few times. Um, mm. <laughs> but Will texted me. Uh, who, by the way, just a little background. Well, I am friends with Will. He was the Pawtucket announcer when I was in Pawtucket. Uh, so Got he played it. cards with me on the bus sometimes. Like I liked Will; he's a good guy, uh, and I've stayed in touch. He's hilarious. I, yeah, I've stayed in touch uh, post my playing days, so I, I do like Will. Uh, but he said at 4:45 p.m. today, "I know you don't give a fuck either way, but I did not say that about you. I said it was a ridiculous draft and listed the guys the Sox picked, which right. is all accurate information minus the last mm-hmm. part of the Red Sox not taking advantage." Uh, my response, I laughed Basically at that said, message. That was, said it was a joke of a draft class. Let's, yeah. And Brian Johnson. So in a talent-rich draft, right. Pat Light and Brian Johnson. So in a talent-rich draft, you'd have to say the Red Sox did not take advantage. <laughs> o two. The O two. I'm glad you're enjoying that, Tyler. I'm sorry, yeah, Pat. I'm sorry. It's a. It's. I mean, listen. At the time, I was like, damn, like the Red Sox got Pat Light from Monmouth. Fuck yeah. Like, let's go, Ben Charrington. And I I was pumped. So I'm not going to sit here now and pretend like I wasn't stoked back then when I heard that fucking Patty Nips got breaded up by the Red Sox in the first round. I'm not going to sit here and have uh, hindsight's 2020 revisionist history. Uh, I remember that day. It was uh, it was a hot july june in june in 2012 and i was i was at the beach Mm -hmm. i was at the beach that day um tons of girls there Mm -hmm. and they were all just trying to like talk to me and stuff and i was like uh today's draft day so i'm looking at this this board here making sure that that pat light from monmouth doesn't come off of it before the red sox get their pick uh and then the red sox came up at 26 37 30 37 they came up at 37 and lo and behold they're like oh from right-handed pitcher from 
fucking Monmouth, and he's from New Jersey too. Uh, Patrick James, light selected by the Boston Red Sox. And I was like, fuck yeah, dude. I was pumped. Yeah. And so I'm not going to sit here today, all these years, a decade later. Like we know how it turned out. But I mean, at the end of the day, I'm not going to say anything bad about your playing career because God, God has a plan. Right, Jake? Yeah. I mean, I, I was 15 years old. Also surrounded by girls right at the time. <laughs> yeah, boy, it, it was one of the best days of my life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it was because they took Pat Light. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Tyler, do you remember where, where you were the day that the Red Sox selected uh, Pat Light in the draft? Yes. Weirdly enough, I was also surrounded by lots of women. <laughs> yeah, uh, of course. But uh, Pat, no offense, I, I was more excited about Devin Marrero at the time. I, mm. I don't mean to be rude. That yeah. glove was something I fell in love with back in the day. Yeah. But uh, Pat, you, you know, you're all right. You, you're here. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. Like I said, that's, you know, it's God's plan. Uh, God had a plan for you, Pat. And it was uh, <clears throat> to end up as a part-time co-host in this podcast. Yeah. Yeah. And you fulfilled that prophecy. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's no doubt about it. Like no one, you're like the Brock Lesnar of the Name Redacted podcast. Like it's, it's a... You're not always here, but when you are, it's a big fucking deal. Huge deal. Um, huge deal. People talk about it. Uh, we're excited to have you here for... This is the third straight or the fourth straight? A third straight, I believe. Third straight, but we're going to have four straight. I believe so, yeah. I don't see any reason why I wouldn't be here Sunday. Right. Okay. <clears throat> By the way, I'd like to, so, I want to I wanna piggyback on that real quick. Because sure. I, I put out a tweet. Please. Because I got a lot of heat. Uh, throughout my minor league career, I actually remember specifically being on a bus uh, in going. I don't know. We were going back to Salem or or leaving Salem, um, and I had I had one of those days where I looked up my name on Twitter, and uh, not you know when you're in Salem, even though you're a first rounder, like you know, you're kind of into the into the doldrums of the minor leagues. No one's really talking about you anymore unless you do something spectacular, um, and it, my name has been popping up quite frequently for whatever reason. And it was a conversation, like a Twitter thread, of people being upset about the 2012 draft and what they could have gotten instead of what they did get. And the name that popped up constantly that people would have preferred instead of me is currently Joey Gallo. Ah. Now, if you watch <clears throat> Yankee Twitter this whole week, they mm-hmm. would gladly taken me over Joey yeah. Gallo. And they just wanted it. They would. They wanted to just get him off the team, right? Listen, a lot of people talking how how it came full circle. People would rather Pat Light at the end of the career rather than Joey Gallo right now. Yeah, I mean, we played that game with Coley. Um, you know, here are all the players that you could have had instead of Pat Light. Uh, you said thirty-seven overall. Yeah, yeah, thirty-seven. Uh, Mitch Haniger was the pick after you. He's an all-star. Uh, Joey Gallo. Was the pick after that? He's been an All Star. Uh, Lance McCullers Jr., very good pitcher for the Houston Astros. Matt fucking Olson got picked after you. Are you shitting me? <laughs> Matt Olson, Matt Olson got picked after you uh, at forty-seven. Jesse Winker, who just hit a bomb today. Uh, at Yankee Stadium, the fourth home run that the Seattle Mariners hit in that game. First three were off Garrett Cole. Uh, and then Jesse Winker became, I believe, the first lefty to hit an extra base hit off of Wandy Rodriguez. Um, Patrick Wisdom, who's just absolutely launching bombs. But I, I don't know if he, if he signed. Patrick Wisdom got drafted after you. Paul Blackburn. All-star this year. Drafted after you. This is fucking pathetic. Alex Wood, who gave up a home run to Mookie Betts last night, drafted after you. And then you have Edwin Diaz. Probably the best reliever in baseball this year was drafted after you. The Red Sox were just like all like... I mean, I get... Did you throw... How hard did you throw your last year at Monmouth? What was it? Your junior year? Yeah, I didn't know that I hit 100, but I know I hit 99 like a ton of times. Oh, okay. Yeah, All I right. was Yeah, I, I guess. Was, I was, and I did well in the Cape uh, as a reliever. Um, there was a lot, of, uh, a lot of hype around me going into the draft. 
I'm so mad. I didn't realize that we could have had Matt Olson instead of you. Mm -hmm. (laughs) This feels mean. That's terrible. Yeah. For anyone that's listening that didn't know that, just know that I'm I'm probably just as mad, if not even more mad than you are. Because I I always like Joey Gallo is always the name that went around. Um, But Matt Olson uh, was picked after Pat Light in that draft. That's tough. Great series by the Red Sox, though. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, great series by the Red Sox. Great beer um, by the Blue Moon Brewing Golden Company, Col- Golden Colorado, uh, Blue Moon. Did you know that? Yeah. <laughs> tell me more. I got to tell you right now. Uh, the baseball and beer go hand in hand and Blue Moon is the perfect stadium companion with its bold flavor, bright explosion of color, iconic orange slice ritual and authentic ballpark roots. In fact, Blue Moon was born in a ballpark, first created at the Sandlot Brewery in Denver, Colorado. From first pitch to extra innings, a Blue Moon guarantees a one of a kind beer experience every single time. The fact that the Red Sox got to play today uh, at what, two o'clock? means we get to podcast earlier which means maybe if we get this podcast done and i don't know let's call it an hour and a half ish i'm shooting for like an hour and a half that means maybe i can go upstairs after this it'll probably be like 11 30 p.m which is enough time for me to go up there put on a movie and uh crack open an ice cold blue moon you're st- you're with Sandra right now are you patrick yeah Ooh. Can you uh can you ask her if she has any um movie recommendations? Hey Sandra. <laughs> Sandra. Tell her Jared's asking. Uh Sandra, Jared needs you. She's gonna come running. Yeah. Uh, she's not answering me. I don't know what's going on. Maybe she she's asleep. Do you want me to go look? Yeah, go look. I'll finish the read and then when we come back, we'll get some movie recommendations okay. with Sandra. Because that's what I'm gonna be doing tonight. I'm gonna be drinking Blue Moon. Watching <clears throat> some scary movies recommended by Sandra um, from its refreshing flavor with Valencia orange peel for a subtle sweetness and hints of coriander. Blue Moon Belgian White is one of a kind beer that's made brighter. It's carefully crafted and full flavored with refreshing notes and a smooth creamy finish. Why strike out with the same old beer when you can get something that's one of a kind? Best served with a signature orange garnish to showcase its beautiful hazy color. A beer this good only comes around once in a blue moon, but you can enjoy it all season long. Break out of your same old beer slump. Blue Moon Belgian White is one of a kind every time. Blue Moon Belgian White delivered by uh, get it <clears throat> by visiting get.bluemoonbeer.com slash Jared. That is J-A-R-E-D. To see your delivery options, that is get.bluemoonbeer.com slash Jared. Blue Moon, made brighter. Celebrate responsibly. Blue Moon Brewing Company, Golden Colorado Ale. Uh, is Sandra sleeping? Uh, no, she, she couldn't hear me. Uh, but she said that she was going to... Um, she has a movie. What is it? The perfect pairing. A perfect pairing on Netflix. A perfect pairing. It's apparently a chick. All right. Mm. Oh, well, then I'll just wait till she comes home. Shut the door. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. The Red Sox trade deadline. It's come and gone. 6 p.m. on Tuesday. Uh, are, where are we at right now? The Red Sox go out and trade Christian Vasquez on Monday. I guess we can start there. Let's, let's go in chronological order here. The Red Sox trade Christian Vasquez to the Houston Astros for a couple of prospects. And a lot of folks are upset. A lot of fans are upset. Christian Vasquez was upset. His teammates were upset. Uh, a lot of people not happy with this. <clears throat> it was uh, not surprising in that moment. I think it became more surprising after the deadline passed and JD and Nate were still here. I think that that's kind of where I fall on like the surprise factor. 
I thought if Vasquez goes, then that's like the that's the first shot. That is the first flare into the night sky. SOS, we're sinking, we're going down. That was the first flare as Christian Vasquez to the Houston Astros. After the game, I was poking around. I was asking people outside the organization, inside the organization, what's next? What comes after this? Is JD still going to be here? Is Nate still going to be here? And I I was up till probably like 2.30 in the morning on Monday night. And the, uh, the general consensus late Monday night was JD's not going anywhere. And I, was, I wanted to tweet that, but I didn't want to jinx it. I was like, what do I gain by putting that out there? And then it ends up being correct. And then people are like, yeah, whatever. Like, you don't get like, cited for a player not getting traded. I was like, the only thing I can do is jinx this and look like an asshole. So Monday night, it was pretty much... I don't want to say a guarantee, but the general consensus was that JD was not getting traded. And, and like, then we saw what the Red Sox, the Andy Martino report came out that night. They were asking for a haul. Like they, they wanted a top five prospect in the system, a guy on the major league roster, and then another piece. Yeah, I don't know how much I trust Andy Martino, for being honest. Overall, but I think he's speaking for one side there, just what's coming out, because you compare yeah. it to what happened with the Nate Evaldi stuff. Asking for the moon. Yeah. I think that's what justifies the Christian Vasquez trade. They got the moon in the deal. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think <clears throat> with uh, Vasquez and the whole you know high asking price, any team that was calling the Red Sox on Vasquez had already spoken to the Cubs about Wilson Contreras, and they were like, what is the lesser of two evils here? Vasquez, I mean, yes, there is a drop-off there. Obviously, like Wilson Contreras is a beast offensively, um, but they needed a fucking catcher, and I'm just surprised. I'm surprised that the Mets... I'm surprised there wasn't like a, or maybe there was a bidding war for Christian Vasquez. We don't know. Um, but Wilson Contreras staying put, the Mets not getting either one, and then Vasquez going to the Astros. Uh, at the time, he gets traded during BP, and you get all the fucking gremlin reporters with their grubbly little hands and trying to stick their phones in his face. Like the dude just found out he got traded fucking 10 minutes ago. It's obviously a very emotional moment for him. Why don't you give him some space? Um, Red Sox PR just yanking him off the stage like it's the goddamn Muppets. <laughs> like that was I've never seen anything like that before, where a player is in front of a media scrum and then someone from PR just like yoink, like you're not talking to those people. Uh, good for them, good for them to have the presence of mind to be like he's probably not in an emotional state where he wants to be on the record right now. Like that, I don't think that that does any favors for anybody. That um, video of him just sitting there when the reporters like. Obviously, he's in shock, but you see him. He couldn't. He didn't even look like he knew where he was for a second. Like he's yeah. looking beyond the reporters, and it's like a couple words every second. He just was like, "It's a business," over and over. And I think yeah. that's the tough part. It's just heartbreaking. Also, yeah, I like the Red Sox and all, but I don't want to give them too much credit. They definitely pulled him away from reporters for other reasons than his emotional well-being. They like were scared what? he was going to say something like he did a few or days ago about the direction might, of the team. Might, yeah, a lot of times these trades, although they get, they get announced, still have a few missing pieces that could happen that could still ruin it. Uh, so they probably don't want comments being said, at least officially, from a Red Sox player or Red Sox personnel uh, about it yet. They, they, they certainly pulled him away for those reasons. Yeah. What do, you, what do you remember most about the swarm of reporters that were at your locker the day that you got traded to the Twins? What I remember most? Oh, man. It's a little blur. Uh, <laughs> oof, man, I just remember... I remember that's that was when uh, it was interesting. That was the second day of uh, the filming of my ESPN thirty for thirty. Uh, right. Yeah. <laughs> and oof, what a whirlwind! What a whirlwind! Mm-hmm. It's almost like they, yeah. they planned it, but um, right. Uh, they we did a, we did a thirty for thirty, and immediately after being traded, they asked me to sit down to do a sixty minutes interview. Um, and mm. so we talked a lot on sixty minutes with Barbara Walters. Is that her name? Barbara right. Walters. Barbara Walters. Yep. Um, mm. and Barbara just, you know, kind of went in and was like, listen, how do you feel? <laughs> and that, that was the first question, Barbara. And me and Barbara have been friends for a long time. Uh, right. Prior so, to that or since then? Huh? Prior to oh, that prior, or since prior. then? Prior. Typically, prior. I mean, 60 prior. Minutes is trying to do interviews with me for years. Uh, right, right, right. And finally, Barbara had, 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 you know, done the old friend card and was like, and I was like, oh, Barbara, you, I'll right. do it this one time. And so, 
Mm -hmm. uh, you know, with a tear in her eye, she goes, Pat, how you feeling? You know, mm -hmm. friend to friend, how are you? And I said, I'm doing, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm doing okay. I'm hanging in there. I, I wanted to stay on the Red Sox, but um, you know, things weren't, weren't there. And you can see all that 60 minute interview. Um, uh, it's on YouTube. It's on YouTube. And uh, they replay it uh, every other Tuesday. Right. Did you, did you think it was unprofessional when she started crying or did you take it as sort of like a compliment to, that spoke to your, your relationship with Barbara? Uh, a little bit of both. Listen. <laughs> you, you thought it was unprofessional. Yeah, listen. I, 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 personally, I, I, I get a lot of emotion out of people. People are, uh, mm -hmm. you know, they're drawn to me. And, you know, mm -hmm. when, when, I'm, when, yeah. I'm, when they feel as though I'm hurting, and when I'm hurting, hurting, when they feel as though hurting. I'm hurting, uh, they, they hurt too. Uh, but right. on top of that... Listen, you got to be professional. Got to do your job. And we're on camera. Got to do your job. Uh, and uh, it was a raw moment from Barbara. Um, but listen, she, we got through the interview and, and here we are. Here we are. And she's... Uh, here we are. Yeah, we're, we're, we're in talks right now doing another 60 Minutes interview. So it's exciting. Really? Yeah. That's crazy. Uh, did, you, did you feel like you might become emotional during the, uh, the interview with Barbara? Uh, well, no, because I'm professional. Um, right, but uh, if I wasn't professional, maybe uh, it was yeah. it was a weird time to be traded. Um, although I kind of expected it, uh, but again, with with ESPN thirty for thirty being filmed, uh, you know, which was also if you gotta remember, guys, it was a little uncomfortable uh, back in the day doing the ESPN for thirty for thirty uh, in uh, <laughs> in um, David Ortiz's last year. Right. All yeah. the cameras yeah. were around me uncomfortable much right hashtag uncomfortable uh, right and so uh you know it was, it was just a weird a weird time then and then you know being they made the entire team stay in the clubhouse uh while i sat down mid clubhouse with barbara to talk about my trade uncomfortable right uncomfortable. We so had, yeah everyone knew why it was happening but it was uncomfortable so you mm -hmm. didn't have a moment like Christian did with Xander Bogarts where you guys kind of just, you know, spent a moment together before leaving and heading to, you know, another dugout? Uh, well, you know, my closest friend of the team was David Ortiz. So me and him, oh, right. yeah, me and Sorry. him were, whew, we were tight. Me and did, did David cry? Not to cut you off. Uh, well, listen, I don't want to, I don't want to divulge personal information, uh, but mm -hmm. yeah, he cried a lot. Um, <laughs> yeah. being, his, being his last year. Um, yeah. You know, trying to go for a World Series and now losing, arguably the most integral piece to that. Um, no one knew why Dave Dombrowski was trading me. Um, right. So you know, me and David, we spent some time together. Uh, my second best friend, probably one B, was Dustin Pedroia, um, wow. with one C being Mookie. So listen, all three of those guys were upset. They they saw their World Series hopes for 2016 kind of circle the drain uh, with me, my my departure. Um, so there was, you know, emotions were high in, in the clubhouse that, that day. Uh, but there's a there's a rumor. I don't think that Barbara addressed it in the interview, but there was a rumor that Dustin Pedroia actually tried to fight Dave Dombrowski once he heard the news that you had been traded. Is that? Can you speak on that? I can wow. speak on that. I can speak on that. Yeah. Now that I'm out of baseball, Please. I don't mind mentioning it. Um, it, it wasn't an attempt. Uh, they did fight. Uh, <laughs> yeah, full Jesus. Yeah. Full physical altercation. Uh, the one thing mm -hmm. they said was had to be neck below just so that they could avoid the cameras. Uh, right. So, so Dave basically <laughs> said, like, I get that you're upset and like, I want you to get this frustration out. Like, I guess we have to fight. Yeah. So D Dave did a good job by just being there and saying, hey, listen, guys, this is this is the move we decided to make. Uh, we understand mm -hmm. it's one of the worst decisions in, in baseball history. But uh, I mean, people at the time were comparing it to trading Dave, uh, Babe Ruth. Uh, so, I, I did hear that. Yeah. yeah. A lot of people a lot said of, that. <laughs> a lot of people. Said, <laughs> yeah. A lot of people said that. Um, so <laughs> it, it was a tough time, uh, you know, you know, a, lot, a couple of kicks to the groin, um, mm -hmm. you know, Hanley, Hanley Ramirez got in the mix a little bit with a few body slams. Uh, right. Dave took a beating, but listen, God bless him. He got back up, uh, after a little bit, he tagged in Mike Hazen made hit, made him take a few shots <laughs> yeah. uh, <laughs> and we got through it. Right. As a, as a team, as a team. <clears throat> right. Yeah. That was, uh. That was a that was a tough year. I mean, there's make no mistake about it. I mean, the 2016 Boston Red Sox got swept in the first round of the playoffs. Um, that doesn't happen if if Pat Light's still here. No. That's just a fact. Just a fact. Um, all that to say, uh, Christian Vasquez is now a member of the Houston Astros. Uh, it it felt weird seeing him in the Astros uniform 
I didn't like it. I actually hated it. Uh, I, I talked to him that night. I talked to him the night during... I, I, yeah, I talked to him that night, the day that he got traded. Um, talked to some of his family. And it was, uh, it was sad. I mean, when you're... He's been in the organization since the year after I graduated high school. Like that's how long Christian Vasquez has been with the Red Sox. 2008 is when he became a part of this organization, came up through the system. And I didn't realize it uh, until Matt Barnes had pointed out, he was like, Christian Vasquez has been my catcher since A-ball. Like I, I've only ever had Christian Vasquez uh, as, as my battery mate since I've been in pro ball. Um, so yeah, I mean, the dude won three division titles, won a world series, uh, and, and was very much a staple in this organization. He came up what in 2014, 2014. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, I, I, uh, I get that. I, what I hate during times like these are when the fucking nerds come out of the woodwork. No offense, Tyler. Continue. Uh, you're not it's almost like the nerds don't allow you to have sentimental value with players especially and i, I hate to say it because i do represent part of the bluminati but a lot of them it's heim blue makes a move and it's immediately the best move ever you know what i oh, mean yeah. and, and that's part of the problem like while i think the deal made sense because listen you weren't going to give him a qualifying offer at the end of the year you're going to give jd a qualifying offer you're going to give nate a qualifying offer you weren't going to give Christian Vasquez somewhere in the realm of 18 to 20 million next year. You know, th- no. th- that's just not reality. I think there's plenty of complaints or complaints about this deadline and whether they should have went and got another catcher or another controllable piece. But realistically, like Christian Vasquez was the one guy, if they got their asking price, they were going to move off of because they weren't going to get anything for him at the end of the year. Yeah. And, and yeah, you weren't going to make him the qualifying offer. I mentioned this with Maz tonight. That when people were surprised that Nate and JD did not go, but Christian Vasquez did, it was like of those three guys that are up at the end of the year, you could make the qualifying offer to Nate and JD and either you're going to get compensated for it or I, I don't mind having either one of them back on a one-year deal for whatever it is, 19 million bucks. Like I'm, I'm more than happy with that. And, and it's totally possible. Like Nate, we've seen the comments, which have been really cool to see, but because he didn't know if he was going to be dealt, but saying like, I want to be here for the rest of my career. We know mm-hmm. how JD feels about here. Uh, you could easily see one of those guys picking it up. But with Christian Vasquez, let's be real. The Red Sox front office has told us what they've thought of Christian Vasquez for some time. They tried to move him in 2020 at the deadline. That's where that Mark Vientos connection really started with the Mets. Uh, and we know this past off season, they were going to acquire Jacob Stallings. They finished as runner-ups for him. So, mm-hmm. you know, it was nice. Big year for Christian Vasquez. Obviously, he's been doing, you know, above average on both sides of the ball. But I think all of us here would question whether that's going to continue into next year. And realistically, the Red Sox, yeah, they weren't going to give him that qualifying offer. So why not get something? And if someone was willing to meet those demands, you get a guy in, in Manuel Valdez who hit his first home run for Worcester today in his second at bat and it's, has 11 home runs in 39 games at AAA. You get Wolger Abreu, who, you know, toolsy outfielder in double A. These were really pieces you didn't have in your minor league system. I can't blame them for going this route. I think you can question them for not doing other things, but the trade within itself in a vacuum made sense. By the way, where, where, where are the Red Sox ranked by Baseball America right now? Is it, it, I saw it was like 19th. Uh, 11 was the last time I looked. Uh, it was right around 11 coming into the year. I, I, I don't know what their midseason was, but most people have them right in that outside the top 10 area. Yeah. Tony was saying something about them being 19th. I was like, what the fuck? Like, I, I thought that they were in the top 10 somewhere. It might be a little different at this point based off graduations and everything because, you know, there's been some different stuff. Obviously, Jaron Duran doesn't count towards the system anymore. Um, and you've had a couple other death pieces come up, the Winkowskis, the uh, Crawfords of the world. But uh, mm. I'll pull it up right now. But they were definitely right in that, like, oh, I think they were 11 coming into the season. That's was the exact number. And you look at it, they have more top 100 guys now than they did then with Rafaela going in and moving in and Bayo's big jump. Yeah. But with the Christian Vasquez deal, you get a couple nice prospects back. I mean, immediately during his press conference, he was like, 
Yeah, I'm happy to be with the Astros, but like, you know, I can still go back to Boston. Like, I'm a free agent at the end of the year. So, I mean, he's, I think he's hoping that, that he gets a call from the Red Sox. I hope they call him. I mean, I, I, at the end of the day, I hope he gets the bag. I, I hope that he gets, he gets paid what he's worth somewhere. I would imagine that's not going to be the Red Sox, but they get to at least pick up the phone and have a conversation. Like, maybe he's a guy that's willing to take a little less to come back. Not that he should or would. Um, but yeah, Vasquez, Astros, couple prospects coming back so that night you know i'm poking around like hey what's the deal here and interestingly enough i had someone outside the organization outside the organization be like um what would you what would you say if the red sox traded chris sale how would that be received and i was like how in the fuck are they gonna pull that off like what team is going to give up anything of value. I think the, like the fan base, I don't know how the fan base would react. They would probably be like, I, I guess it all depends. Like, is it an Eric Hosmer situation where you're paying the rest of his salary anyway to, to free up the roster spot? Like, is the roster spot worth that much to you? They're not going to disrespect Chris Sale to the point where they release him or something like that. Um, but yeah, it was interesting that, that, that sales name came up and then Heim Bloom one of his quotes the after the trade deadline expired was if you could think of it then we discussed it if it's something that you could think of we probably discussed it uh so yeah that's that's another interesting note so then the trade deadline tuesday just um, for con- context jared it is 11 by the way for the they are 11th on baseball america yeah i'm i'm guessing he's either looking at keith law who hates anything Red Sox and has their system constantly way lower than it should be ranked or he's looking maybe at pipeline. Yeah. Okay. I can live with 11th, I guess. Um, so deadline day, uh, it was very confusing. You, you see the tweet. I forget who had it. Maybe Mark Feinzen said Tommy Pham is being traded. Don't know where. It's either the Red Sox or uh, Mets. Who was the other t- the Mets, yeah, it's either the Red Sox or the Mets. Uh, you're either going to a contender or you're going to the Red Sox. <laughs> um, it ended up being the Red Sox, and I was like, whoa, okay. All right, Tommy Pham. Don't, don't hate it. Uh, we can have more reaction to that. And then um, you see the Juan Soto stuff is happening. Like, all right, here we go. It's down to the Dodgers. It's down to the Padres. It's down to the Cardinals. And then the Padres uh, emerge as the favorite. And now they're at the finish line. And now they're wrapping this thing up. And wait a second. Eric Hosmer is going to be included in this deal. Wow. That's a, that's a very interesting little tidbit. Eric Hosmer to the Nats. Oh, wait. Eric Hosmer has a limited no trade clause where he can veto a trade to 10 different teams. And the Washington Nationals are one of those teams. And interestingly enough, the Red Sox are not. So it's not like... It's not like the the Padres traded Eric Hosmer to the Red Sox and he waived his uh, no trade clause to come here. Uh, I'm not saying he doesn't want to be here. I talked to him. He's very excited. Um, But he couldn't have stopped a trade to Boston even if he wanted to. So then I think Heyman had the report where uh, he was essentially saying if Eric Hosmer vetoes his trade to D.C., the Padres and Nats will still find a way like this isn't going to blow this thing up. Like, don't worry about it. Like if Hosmer's in great, if he's not, then it is what it is. Like Soto still going to San Diego. So Hosmer exercises his uh, limited no trade clause. Now he's not going to DC. And then out of fucking nowhere, Eric Hosmer to the Red Sox. (laughs) And, you know, Alex Cora talked about it on Tuesday after or before the game on Tuesday. And he was like, yeah, like when I was in the hunt to become the Red Sox manager the first time, I remember the it was between JD and Hosmer of who's going to Boston. And now they're both here. And there were a lot of people who wanted Hosmer back then. A lot of people a wanted Hosmer. A lot of people. Yeah. A lot of people wanted Hosmer. Um, Padres fans no longer wanted Eric Hosmer. They hate uh, him. They hate him. The ground balls. Uh, the, the four gold gloves, I'm sure they're tired of hearing about the four gold gloves because the defense has, uh, taken a bit of a hit 
And then that might be putting it lightly. Yeah. Minus one defensive run saved over there and like 23rd percentile outs above average. Yeah. So I here's here's the thing with the Eric Hosmer deal. You get Eric Hosmer for free. The San Diego Padres are fronting the entire bill for that. You just have to pay him whatever it is, like seven hundred thousand dollars. You're paying him the league minimum for the next three years. Uh, he has a he can opt out of his deal at the end of this year, which he's obviously not going to. He's making thirteen million dollars a year over the next three years. Um, you give up Jay Groom, a former first round pick in the 2016 Major League Baseball draft. Uh, he was a high pick too because the Red Sox finished in last place in 2015, and at the time. He was being called the next Clayton Kershaw. That curveball was as lethal pre Tommy John as any curveball I had seen in minor league baseball in recent years. Yeah, I remember. I was with, um, I was in studio talking about this dude with with Beetle and Zell in 2016. It was, it was either the the day of or the day before the draft. I was in the studio with with Zolak and Bertrand. Talking about Jay Groom and how he's the next Clayton Kershaw. Not, not my words. The, like actual scouts were saying this. Then he has the Tommy John surgery. Not the same guy. He was on the 40 man roster, uh, was not going to be protected in the Rule 5. And I think at the end of the year, he was eligible to become a minor league free agent anyway. So he would have been Rule 5 eligible <laughs> this year. So they, they had the 40 man crunch coming in. Yeah. Um, so and they my, weren't going to protect him. No. And for a lot of people, you know, I get it. Lefty 23, blah, blah, blah. He just got to AAA. He's had fine numbers this year. But it, for the scouts who've watched him and you can talk about the wave of arms, whether it's Bayo, Winkowski, Cutter, uh, Walter, Murphy. Now, he was always the guy they put all the way in the back. The stuff is just not anything special. It, it's no. like low 90s fastball. He really doesn't lean on the curve. It's more of a slider profile. Commands poor. Um, and Sox prospects, they were going to push him back to 19th in the system in their most uh, recent rankings. So the stock's just continuing to dwindle. And a lot of people didn't think he'd succeed in a relief profile. Yeah. So essentially, and you got two prospects have been, back too. You got two prospects and Eric Cosmer with the entire bill paid for by the Padres uh, for a left handed <clears throat> prospect that uh, you. I don't want to guarantee, but let's just say 95% would not have been in the organization next year anyway. For nothing. For nothing. Uh, And the other thing, in addition to the note about the Padres picking up the tab on Hosmer's contract, is you may be looking at this situation being like, well, what about Tristan Cassis? We have Tristan Cassis coming. Why, Why would they have Eric Hosmer for three years? When you have your top prospect is a first baseman and like DH, like what do you do at DH? Like you're not going to DH Eric Hosmer next year. He's not a designated hitter. Well, if the Red Sox really want to, they can just release him. It doesn't cost them anything. Like literally, they, they will, it is no harm, no foul. If you want to start next season with Eric Hosmer as your first baseman. And then Tristan Cassis is ready. I think Heim Bloom said it today, uh, either before or after the game. I don't know. I, I saw the clip after the game, but I don't know when it was when it was recorded. Uh, but Heim Bloom said that uh, Tristan Cassis' timetable is entirely in his hands. Like the Red Sox aren't looking at it as, "Hey, we want him up by, by this month, this year, whatever." Uh, when he's ready, he'll be here. So in the meantime, you have. Eric Hosmer is literally the Red Sox first first baseman since fucking Mitch Moreland. And I think on top of it, it's like with Hosmer, if he's only making the minimum here and the Padres are fronting his contract in terms of just releasing him, as long as he continues to do what he does, you should still be able to move him and get something back. You're not going to get anything crazy, but it's just a bridge. And I think the fair argument is, should they have done this move a long time ago? Yeah. You know, you're basically admitting your wrongs with a lot of the moves you made at this deadline. But when you have Franchi Cordero and Bobby Delvick over there as of late, just average as can be is such a massive upgrade for you. And in terms of replacing Vasquez, Vasquez is like a 106 OPS plus guy this year. Hosmer is 112. So you're getting a little more bat from what you pulled out. 
Pat, <clears throat> when you saw that Eric Hosmer was coming down uh, to the Boston Red Sox, what was your reaction? Uh, well, <clears throat> before I had seen that the Padres were picking up the whole tab, I thought, uh, what, what are we doing? Uh, but then when we're getting Eric Hosmer guy like that for free, and some of you guys didn't mention, but I think Tyler possibly mentioned this on Twitter. Uh, Jared may have done as well. I mean, you guys both tweet about this type of stuff. So <clears throat> uh, to have a young up and coming first baseman who you are excited about, uh, to have one of the better first basemen in the past decade and a half, uh, be able to be the guy um, they're kind of mentoring him. Uh, it's not a bad thing. You know, I know that Red Sox system. I know the coaches they have down there um, for the most part. Uh, they got some good infield guys, uh, but they don't have anyone like Eric Hosmer. Um, so to have that type of guy in your system for free almost, um, not to mention a good clubhouse guy, if this team do- were to make a run, uh, doubtful this year, but if they were to make a run this year or next year, um, you got a guy that's been there before, who's done it before, who's won World Series before. Um, there is no negative to adding Eric Hosmer and to get rid of Jay Groom, uh, a guy, the, one of the few people that I've ever been asked for by Boris Corp to help them get. Uh, I don't know if they ended up getting him or not. I can't recall. Uh, but he was a Jersey guy. Uh, I remember the the profile, the draft profile of this guy. Again, as Tyler mentioned, this is why I love having him on the show. Uh, there, not much there uh, as of late or as of the past couple of years. I haven't really... If I don't hear about you and you were being talked about the, as the next Kershaw, like I'm the average minor league fan. I'm going to hear about the big guys. That's it. Um, so if I haven't heard about you, you're not worth much. Uh, so moving him is, is not a bad thing at the end of the day. And, and we got a few guys back uh, from what I understand from Tyler as well. So uh, getting Hosmer is... A, is there's no negative that can come from it that I can see. And Jared, just to give you uh, credit there, you were right. He was on the 40 man uh, coming in to the trade. Um, but you look at what you got at first base this year, 203 batting average, 29th in baseball, 278 OBP, 27th slugging, 349, 28th. With some of the worst defense you're going to see. Bottom know. three. Yeah, <clears throat> you like horrendous defense overall, defensive run saved. Franchi Cordero, minus three defensive run saves. Bobby Delbix right at the bottom in terms of that stat as well. So just average there will go such a long way. And I think bringing in Hosmer here, not that you expect him to be a savior or anything like that, but you get a little bit more bat and just the dependability of knowing and it's more roster build. You're not playing guessing games there all the time. The only thing I think that you can question is how he fits with Bobby Delbeck. Uh, Because, you know, Hosmer is a reverse splits kind of guy. What does that mean for Dalvik, who kind of, you know, really hits lefties really well? Well, I mean, Bob's been hitting in general recently. He looks good. He looks good. He's been hitting the ball hard. Um, Had that sick pick. Was that Monday or Tuesday? It was Schreiber. Schreiber, so Monday. Monday, yeah. And... Luckily, luckily, we didn't have to have this conversation. And I was going to tweet it, but I don't know how it would have been received on Monday night. But it felt like Alex Cora was managing that game to get the win for Nate in what could have been his last start uh, with the Red Sox. I mean, obviously, I, I, think, I, I think why I didn't tweet it was because you would have had your, your dumb asses coming in and be like, oh, so he doesn't manage to win every game, blah, 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 blah. Of course, he manages to win every game. I think the way that he managed that game felt very like this is a big game. Like he, he had defensive replacements late. He used his best bullpen options. Um, yeah, I, I think that that and, and, and when he took Nate out of the game, there was a conversation that took place that I didn't ask. I didn't ask uh, what was said. But it it didn't seem like your prototypical Alex just coming to get the ball from one of his starters in uh, one of 162 regular season baseball game. It felt to me that I don't know if you got Pat, did you watch the game? No, of course it didn't. You did. Yeah. Did you notice any of the, any of the things that I just said? I noticed that there was uh, it seemed to be again like you said not your run of the mill 
uh, exchange. I don't know exactly what might have been said, obviously, um, but uh, you know, I could understand why why you're saying what you're saying. Yeah, Alex is a very sentimental guy, and I think he, uh, especially Nate, for what he did in eighteen and uh, what he what he's meant to this organization since he came over in the summer of eighteen. I think Alex would uh, take a bullet for Nate. So if if he thought that it could be the end for for Nate in a Red Sox uniform, it's not just someone getting traded. It's like that that was my horse. That was my horse that uh that helped put a ring on my finger in, in my first year here uh as manager. So yeah, it just felt like there was a little something extra that night. Um obviously everyone was emotional coming off of the the Vasquez trade and you know it was it was either they said it on the broadcast like this is either an audition for other teams that are interested saying you know Nate was was down for a month and the velocity is not what it was since he came back but I'm proving myself as someone that can help out a contender if that's what you're looking for so is either that or the Red Sox could look at it and say this is a guy that can help us get into the playoffs uh, the last two months of the season here and it would appear as though it was the latter. Uh, like, I, like I said last episode, I didn't think he was going to get dealt. But after that outing, I started to doubt it more. It's just like you're talking about a guy who the horse last year through the postseason. We all know what he did in 2018. He just feels like the perfect rental. Like if you're looking for an arm and like the Cardinals were one of those teams where I was kind of staring at them. Could you imagine Nate Evaldi just having that kind of guy? And, you know, they're having issues with Flaherty and everything. But having that in your back pocket is someone you could lean on. He's been one of the better postseason pitchers, really, of his generation. And for the Red Sox, I don't blame them for go ahead and saying, you know, give me the moon or don't do anything else because they needed innings. You know, you picture this rotation and Nick Pavetta having to, you know, go out there and be the ace for the next two months. That's a hard sell on anybody, even if you are going down into the tank. Um, But I'm surprised. I thought a team, if they were going to fold on anybody and give the Red Sox some ridiculous offer, I thought it would have been him. Yeah. You know what's crazy is, is Nate. Nate was a rental for us. In Jalen Beeks. The Beak Man. Big Beeks goes to Tampa and you get Nate in a in a deal where everyone's like, oh yeah, whatever. You know, that's nice. He's injured all the time. Who cares? Yeah, we Yankees had him. You suck, dude. Good luck with Nate. Yeah. Turns into a fucking legend. And then parlays that postseason performance into a fat contract with the Boston Red Sox to stay right right there. Uh, but at the time, I mean, this dude pitched his nuts off as a rental. He didn't fucking, I mean, obviously he became one of the boys, <clears throat> but when he got there, I mean, what, what did he owe the Red Sox? He was about to hit free agency and this is not the organization that drafted, developed him. He did not spend any time here. It's just like, yeah, like you guys traded for me to, to help you out in the playoff run, but um I guess, uh, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll take down the Yankees at Yankee Stadium and the fucking Astros uh, in the middle of a dynasty. I'll, I'll take them down in Houston and then I'll go and have one of the most legendary postseason performances of all time in L.A. Yeah, if you want me to do that, sure, fine. And then he did. It, like, it's such a moment that when we talked about Nick Pavetta last year and what he did, it's like he pulled an Ovaldi. Like, that's going to be what kind of legacy he has here. That moment, those moments coming in in extra innings and giving what he did and, you know, saving the bullpen and all that. He's just really been the bridge when, unfortunately, Chris Sale's body oh, has failed. Tyler, with the fucking and internet. That's tough. Dude. You, know, you lose your ace, most teams. You uh, know. All right, you're back. Okay. You oh, cut out. Big hello, time. hello. Still there? Hello. Yep. Okay, we're back. No, but, Bye. you know, he was the bridge when you lost Chris Sale. And for a lot of teams, you lose your ace. For multiple years or even just one year, it's completely over. Fortunately, Nate Evaldi last year, you know, it really started during the pandemic season where he started to step up, but he stepped up in 2020, 2021, finished fourth in Cy Young voting, had the best FIP in the whole American league. And then this year, you know, he's battled some injuries, but still when he's been on the mound, he's been the guy you look at and you can at least breathe a little bit. Yeah. Um. We haven't talked about Reese McGuire yet. But first, I want to talk about Athletic Greens. 
And I've needed, I'm, I'm just going to throw that label out there. I've needed at Athletic Greens over the last couple of days here. I've been going nonstop, wake up early, meeting, photo shoot, video shoot, podcast, stream, watch the game, live tweet, go to DK office, do this thing, take that call, take that meeting, do this radio hit. It's been nonstop. It's been nonstop. Uh, and, and our next partner here has a product that I use literally every day for this reason. I started taking AG1 because I wanted better gut health and more energy. And now, they've been on it for a few weeks. And I can tell you right now that it works. What is it though? With one delicious scoop of AG1, you're absorbing 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source superfoods, probiotics, and aptogens to help you start your day right. Um, The energy thing is the big part for me. And there's another reason why. And I'll tell you in a second. Uh, Again, I do the four podcasts a week. We did the stream last night. By the way, we we switched the stream to YouTube and it's way better. Right, Jake? It's so much better, especially after you rip a couple AG ones. Exactly. Exactly. The stream next Tuesday... Uh, I forget what's so... Sp- oh, we're playing the Braves next week. That's why it's going to be cool. Red Sox Braves for the stream next week. Uh, but yeah, I'll be popping the AG1 all day. Um, but yeah, I get, I get tired. What do you want me to do? Waking up and taking my AG1 gives me the energy that I need uh, to perform all these tasks, talk to these guys all day, be on my A game. It's got all my vitamins and minerals that I need in one scoop serving. That's it. Now that I'm on the road more, I'm going to, uh, I'll be in Queens on Sunday. I'm doing the Mets pregame show on Monday and then flying back during the game because I've got to be in the DK office on Tuesday morning to do a bunch of stuff. Then we're coming back to my place to hopefully build a set in my apartment. So I'm just going to be busy. I need the energy. And the to-go, the to-go packs are what's uh, going to save my ass here. Cost you less than three bucks a day. You're investing in your health and it's cheaper than your cold brew habit. And here's the big thing for me. The big reason why I do it. It supports better sleep quality and recovery. As someone who clearly works out, I look tremendous. It supports better sleep quality and recovery. Right now, it's your your time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. It's just one scoop uh, in a cup of water every day. That's it. There's no need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you one free year of one se- one free year again, one free year supply of immune supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs uh, with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com/redsox. Again, that is athleticgreens.com slash Red Sox to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Um, the Red Sox traded for the dude that got arrested for jerking off in public. Fuck yes. Yeah. Listen, um, I, you got Jake Diekman off your roster. That is the greatest gift I've gotten in quite some time. Yeah. I, uh, I haven't hated a reliever so much in Heim Bloom. What a mistake. And I don't, you know what? I don't give a fuck if he's thrown two scoreless innings since he got traded. Good for him. You'll see the pain eventually. It's as bad as it gets. Mm-hmm. If you look at how bad he was this year, he's the third least valuable reliever in all of baseball. That's not good. And obviously, you got him off the books for next year, and he had a team option for the following year. But to get anything back, thank you for admitting you were wrong, Heim. A good defensive catcher you got back. Seven defensive runs saved in 399 innings. I was gonna uh I was gonna put a cap on the jerk off jokes on Twitter because I can't do it all the time. It's gonna get old quick. Uh, for me, it's already old. I did two and I was like, by the second one, I was like, all right, I've had enough of this. I mean, he did jerk off in public, in his car, in a parking lot. At Dollar Tree. A Dollar Tree parking lot. It was during the pandemic? I believe so. 
everyone's doing oh. some weird shit during the pandemic. Actually, I can confirm it was right before everything got crazy with COVID. So when guys are getting down to spring training, basically. Mm. Pat, you ever jerk off in your car before? Uh, not that I can recall. So not a no. Not a no. Not that I can not recall. Not a no. Um, yeah. He, I'm sure. <laughs> I think the craziest part about like the body cam footage is that the cops tried to give him an out and he didn't take it. They were like, what's going on here? Like, you have like a roommate or something? You don't like have anywhere you can be private with this? And he was like, no. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> I just like jerking off my car. Uh, yeah, so not the brightest bulb. But at the end of the day, uh, I, I threw a couple tweets out there on his first day. And uh, I, I'm, I'm ready to move on from it. I'm ready to move on from it. It was... It was uh, when you're the emotional roller coaster of deadline day. The Red Sox had traded Christian Vasquez, who I love. Uh, I thought I was about to lose Julio and Nate, who I really love. I don't have a relationship at all with Nate. I've met him a couple times, like in passing, but like I don't even, if he walked by me, I don't even know if he would say hi. Uh, no personal grudges, just like he's one of those guys. Um, but I thought I was about to have Julio ripped away from me. And I was about to be very upset and emotional. And I, I, I told Jake, I was like, if, if JD gets traded, I don't want to do the stream. I was like, I, I don't think I can like sit on camera and talk about it for four fucking hours. Like, I think I'd rather just like listen to Celine Dion cry and eat Skittles or something. I don't know. I, I, I don't know what I was going to do, but I was going to be very upset about that. So um, <clears throat> the Red Sox trade well first of all like when they trade for tommy fam i i didn't know what to think of that at first like obviously he he had the whole like bitch slapping jock peterson thing this year and so that trade gets made and then they trade jake deepman for reese mcguire and i i i genuinely like i heard the story i didn't remember the name like i knew that there was like a, a baseball player that got arrested for jerking off in, in a car in a parking lot uh i did not remember his name so it was the way that it played out in my timeline was, I'm sure, very funny for people who did know who he it, was. It was hard I, to watch. I, <laughs> like, I watched you and I was like, oh, no, he like the jokes are coming in. And I'm like, he's about to like figure this out. And I'm like, yeah. And like, I yeah. know the Tommy Pham stuff like, you know, you're, you're I like thinking, Tommy Pham. Yeah, I don't think you hate him, but it was just like. I think you had a tweet. It was like, we got the guy who slapped someone and the dude who got caught masturbating in public. Yeah, I was like, uh. Like so, the Red Sox big offseason or big trade deadline moves are they got the guy who slapped someone in the face over fantasy football and the dude who got arrested for jerking off in public. That's that's what they did. We're shaking um, things up. Yeah, Literally. I knew the tweet would hit, and it did. <laughs> What'd you Good say, that. Pat? I said uh, he said we're shaking things up. I said literally. <laughs> ah, I get it. Continue. I I knew the tweet would hit, so I. I, I tweeted it. I like the Tommy Pham edition. I think he brings that fuck you, that attitude, that energy that the Red Sox... Honestly, and I didn't want to put it on him. He brings in now what Verdugo brought in in 2020 and then just kind of stopped bringing. Like that carefree, but also that fuck you attitude and like that energy... Like, I, I feel like we haven't seen that from Verdugo much. Like, Verdugo has been, uh, I, I, like, not in a negative way, but, like, I, I, he hasn't stood out. He hasn't stood out to me this year. It, it's he not, hasn't brought the same energy and attitude this year. It's not the same spark. And, you know, I don't know. I think the last time we saw it for stretches last year, you know, the Yankee Stadium thing, he gets hit by the ball and we see him kind of going at the fans. But it's been a down year for him. But I, I think with Fam, it's just he fits the roster really well. And part of it's Rob Ref Snyder going down as well. But, you know, people will look at the line and say, oh, he's not that good. It's an 88 way to runs created plus below league average hitter. He mashes lefties. 130 way to runs created plus 834 OPS. Yeah. Can absolutely <clears throat> mash. And he has team control. Sure. Mutual option for 2023 at six mil. He can play the position. I mean, and, the bar is so fucking low for me right now. And he hustles. He can. He hustles. He scored from first on that Devers double. Uh, and that's what I was talking about with like the energy and, and being like a clubhouse guy. Because first of all, part of the reason why he smacked the shit out of Jock was because Jock made fun of the Padres. 
Tommy Pham wasn't even on the Padres anymore. He was still mad enough to defend his former teammates, never mind his current teammates. He smacked the shit out of Jock for defending his former teammates. Uh, you saw him score from first on a Devers double. He scores, gets up. He's like hugging JD. He like flipped Verdugo's chain and then he goes into the dug- like he, he's he been here for less than a fucking day and he, he already meshes with, with those guys. So I, I'm very much and it's not just because I'm afraid of Tommy Pham beating my ass, which he obviously would. I, I genuinely like the fit. Uh, from the fact that he can hit lefties and just what he brings intangibles wise, like I got I'm all in on the Tommy Fam edition. And then when it comes to Reese McGuire, you know, I think you look around the league, and we've been fortunate to have Christian Vasquez, a guy that can play uh, a good, solid defense at the catching position. Um, some people give him shit for his pitch framing or whatever. And I know I, Pat said he hated pitching yeah, to him because he I, sucks at calling a game. Is that what you said, Pat? Okay. Pat, Wait, what'd you say, Pat? Pat I can defend you, you. Go ahead, Tyler. Okay. Just some splits here uh, in case we got into it. Ovaldi with both catchers. Vasquez, 498 ERA. Plawecki, 396 ERA this uh-huh. year. Waka, Vasquez, 375 ERA. Plawecki, 040 ERA. Cutter Crawford, Vasquez 488 ERA, Poweki 303 ERA. Now, I mean, Poweki is the face of the franchise. Like, I, you're not going to get an argument from me there. I think it's just more so that Pat, Pat fucking hated Christian um, personally and professionally. <laughs> okay, now we have to bring it back in here. Um, what? You don't? No, I liked Christian. He was. Um, me and him, uh, he leaves in AAA, fucked around a lot as far as like, uh, we. we we messed with each other a bunch, but um, the only negative I really had, it wasn't so much a negative with, with Christian because uh, it didn't really matter so much to me, but the, the thing that, that Vasquez did a lot that I thought that he wasn't doing the best job he could for his pitchers, what he, what he would call a very similar game for almost everybody, whether you were a, a soft tossing lefty or a hard throwing righty, uh, you know, if you got a guy throwing 91 from the left side, uh, you know, fastballs up, a lot of ri- lot of risk there because if he doesn't get it all the way up, you know, that ball is a meatball right down the middle. You can get away with that with a guy like maybe like a Matt Barnes who's going to throw that at 98 or Nathan Avaldi who you might miss a bat still if he leaves it a little bit lower than he's expected to. So that's the only thing I had against Vasquez. It was it just yeah we get it. You think he sucks? No, I didn't think he sucked. Certainly, uh, I want to make sure that that is not the quote card that we have here for Jake. <laughs> Uh, but um, I I liked Christian. I liked throwing to him. He he was a hard worker back there. Uh, he pulled for his guys. He was very positive. But um, uh, I thought that he could have mixed it up a bit more for d- different types of uh, pitchers. And I can pro- I mean, to Tyler's also defensive. Uh, the stats he just pulled up, it certainly probably crossed people's minds. I mean, they look at every statistic known to man nowadays. I bet you that came up in in the front office meetings that you know. Guys weren't quite performing as well. And I wouldn't be even been surprised if uh, they were asked, if these guys were asked, some of these veteran guys, they were asked about uh, throwing to Christian. Because I remember back in my day, and I don't necessarily need to withhold names now, but I remember back in my day, um, at least there was rumors. I don't have any confirmation this is accurate, but at least there were rumors that Blake Swihart was getting the can uh, because guys like David Price and, and Rick Porcello didn't like throwing to him anymore. I thought he was shit behind the plate and, and didn't do a good job Rat. again. I don't know if that's accurate, uh, but that mm-hmm. was rumors that were flying amongst the players. No, those are, those are true. Okay, so there you go. Um, I don't know about Rick, but... I definitely heard David. I, David was the name that popped up. I don't remember. I thought Rick was involved, but it's been a long time, so he might not have been. Uh, but Rat. yeah, I, I do recall that. I recall, you know, so veteran... What's up? Anything? Hmm? Hmm? I just just got the urge to eat some cheese is all. <clears throat> okay, good. Mm-hmm. Good. Anywho. Hmm. Yeah, so uh, hmm. I'm on record saying I like Christian Vasquez. I love Christian Vasquez. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, there's some other guys that you mentioned that... Uh, <clears throat> um. I'm just not as much in favor of, you know. 
I don't recall saying mean things about anybody. I, I didn't say you said anything mean. What are you referring to right there, then? What do you mean? <laughs> Did you not insinuate right there that I had said things maybe unfavorable about some players? No, 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 no. I know. I just said that you mentioned someone that uh, <clears throat> might have been a rat. <clears throat> oh, might have. Okay. Yeah, mm. yeah that's. Uh, those are things that may or may not have happened, but definitely did. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right, 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 right. Um, anyways, so. Uh, Hey, but not not completely relevant, but relevant to the pod. You guys remember the name Glendon huh? Rush? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Friend of, friend of the program, Brandon Drury just said, "Oh, friend, friend of the, the program." Podcast. Yeah, it just makes sense because he just tweeted at me saying that he loved the sh- loved the the show about my nonsense in Vegas. Yeah, three hundred twelve dollars in fucking waters, dude. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. He was funny. I was talking to a buddy of mine. Yeah, uh, uh-huh. and we were on the phone, and he was saying, you know. You know, how's the no drinking going for the last two weeks? Uh, I was like, it's great. He goes, you know, this is my parents' place down here. It's not mine. So, like, haven't really had, haven't paid anything, which has been nice. Besides, I said, like, I had a pretty big uh, grocery store bill. And this just shows you, like, depending on where you are, the perspective of how much money you're spending changes. I was like, dude, I had this fucking huge grocery bill, though. Like, because I, I paid for it for two weeks. It was like 350 bucks. And <laughs> he's like, Okay, well, in Vegas, you would have had four bottles of water for that. <laughs> I was like, oh, well, when you put it like that, it doesn't sound like that much anymore. Uh, I got <laughs> yeah, food like, for two weeks or four bottles of water. I mean, I'm, I'm happy for you, man. I really, I really am. I'm glad that, uh, I'm glad you have something else to post TikToks about instead of Mike Trout. Thank you. And, uh, um, thank you. Actually, fun fact, um, as you, uh, um, as you tweet, uh, I did tweet. Yeah, fun fact. Um, there have been talks on Twitter. People, uh, people from the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim, uh, wanting uh, Patty Westside to put together a group to buy the Angels. Uh, yeah. Can you do that? Yeah, I mean, first person in the group. Guess what? Jarek Robs. I would. Wow. I would love. To take on the task of rebuilding the Angels. You First thing I would do is trade Mike Shohei and Otani. Yeah, I would trade Shohei to the Red Sox. If yeah. possible. I don't know that I would trade Shohei to the Red Sox, honestly. I would trade... Uh, <laughs> you can't do any trades with the Red Sox, Jared. You would be investigated, for, you'd be investigated for tampering so fast. <laughs> I'm not a fucking fan, dude. I'm in the media. Unbiased national reporter. I'm in the media, dude. I have a national brand. That's I have a true. national brand. A baseball national- is dead, Jake. Jake, baseball is dead. What kind of show is that? Yeah, it's all about all, all 30 teams. It's not specific to any team. Exactly. Baseball is Dead is a national baseball podcast that ranks amongst the top baseball podcasts in the fucking world, first of all. Um, what if podcast I, is this about? This is no one really knows it doesn't even have a name here's a question let's for Mm -hmm. example play a scenario in which me and jared buy the uh los angeles angels of anaheim can we switch it just back to the california angels sure first that's the first order of business i fucking hate like anaheim angels i can like i hate that they went like yeah oh we want to like tap into the los angeles market guess what that's where dodger fans are you fucking idiots yeah bad idea uh, but Bad idea. Let's say, for example, this happens. Put together a group. Mm. All four of us, uh, with, you know, along with Pete, uh, decide to buy the Angels. Okay. We put Jared, director of baseball ops, uh, mm-hmm. immediately. Uh, yep. He is in charge of completely running the franchise with no oversight from, from myself or any of the other people. We're allowing him to just run, run rampant with it. Mm-hmm. Day one, we'd change name to California Angels. Day two, yep. Shohei and Trout traded to the Red Sox for cash <laughs> considerations. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The uproar. Or I would trade them for like Franchi Cordero. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the uproar that would happen in baseball. 
I don't think I don't think the front office, the Major League Baseball office, would let it go through. <laughs> I mean, Francie Cordero hit a home run that was really far last year. <laughs> and okay, let's add to the scenario that you get yeah. asked questions at a press conference, and that is your response. <laughs> <laughs> Be like, Jared, um, question. So you <laughs> traded Mike Trout and Shohei Otani to the Boston Red Sox for Franchi Cordero. What were you thinking there? First of all, we're trying to get under the luxury tax. Um, so the Red Sox were willing to take on Mike Trout's contract in full. We obviously had to attach a, a pitching prospect, Shohei Otani, to, uh, the, to Mike Trout's enormous contract. Um, and then we took, a, we took... There's a lot of potential in Franchi Cordero. Um, he hit a really long home run in Philadelphia last year, and he can play multiple positions. <laughs> like he, he is he, able to do that. Yeah, he. I don't know if you've seen it, but he's infield, outfield. We might try him out in the bullpen. He's very. He's basically. I don't know where he's from. Let's just say the Dominican Republic. He is the Dominican Shohei. Like a lot of people have have called him that, but um, better. But yeah, and it's because we haven't really seen it yet. Let me make sure I get his home country correct. Uh, he is Dominican. Yeah, okay, so. nailed that. Um, yeah, they're calling him the Dominican Shohei Otani. So, I mean, you gotta you gotta give something to get something. And we we knew we knew that it would it would hurt uh, ultimately to to get rid of um, you know the uh, Shohei Otani. Who I mean, still, are we really sure if he's even good at this point? Like, it's not even. Like he hasn't done it for like that long, you know. Like it could be a fluke. Um, so the whole thing with with him is we're we're selling high, we're selling high, and uh, we got back a really good player in Frenchie Cordero. <laughs> that we're excited to have him. Yeah. We're excited to have him here in fucking Anaheim, wherever we are. You guys saw that play in the first game where he went back on that ball in right field, and instead of trying to catch the ball, he just tackled the right field wall. <laughs> yeah. Didn't even put his glove up to try and catch it. Just ran into the wall. Yeah. So, I mean, listen, who, who's, the, who's the baseball executive here? Uh, it's me. And you guys are the ones that are sitting down there asking the fucking questions because I have the answers, not you. Um, so go ahead and question the move if you want, but we're, we're building towards a championship right now. Well, I mean, I don't understand how they'd have any rebuttals after that. Right. And they'd have to accept it because, I mean, Mike Trout makes a lot of money. And right now... We're not in a position to contend. So what sense does it make for us to spend all that money on one player when we're not ready to win a World Series and we have a team that's generous enough to take on that albatross of a contract and give us a player that can hit 500 foot home runs in exchange for that? Pretty good deal. And we attach for a time. time. <laughs> take no time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I've, I'm assuming no one else has any other questions. No, no. I think that was handled magnificently. Thank you. Yeah, this is why you're director of baseball ops uh, for the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim. Listen, I, I can sit up there for hours and just give them answers that sound like they make sense. But <laughs> speaking <laughs> of defend my actions, speaking of PR, which you just handled fantastically, what, what, are, we th what are our thoughts on uh, on um, Duran's comments? I don't know why people were so butthurt about those. I didn't. I mean, I, I didn't mind them. Did you see my my rephrasal? No, you did it like the media trained way, Pat. Like that's how the organization would want him to say one hundred. Mm. Well, here's the thing: you you first off, you're taught in media one hundred and one to never alienate your own fan base. Um, but uh, I can't remember. I got to type my my own Twitter handle in because I don't remember what the fuck yeah. I said. Um, cool. but the only thing I really just didn't like, essentially was the fact that one who was coming from, I like Jaron Duran. I think he's a, good, a talented player. He hasn't really performed exactly the way we wanted him to yet, but he's still young. Uh, but the thing I just didn't love about it was that you're, the team that you're playing on, that you're a part of and an integral part in that team, just had one of the worst months in baseball that I've seen to date. And now you're getting mad at the fans for questioning... Um, for questioning, you know, the direction of the team, not to mention the trade deadline we just had. Uh, Hein Bloom, I think, is handling it exceptionally well. You know, coming out and saying that he'd love, he's his door is open to any player that wants to talk to him about it. Specifically, uh, Xander Bogarts. I'd love to talk to him first. 
Uh, I think he's doing an exceptional job with the, with the media. Um, I just he said, "Doubt us, go ahead, but don't be cheering us when you doubted us the whole time." I mean, uh, you know, this is this is Boston. This is what you deal with when you when you struggle for a month. And then my exact rephrasal, Jared, I'll give it to you on the pod, was, "Listen, we had a tough month, but hang with us. We still believe in this team. We need you guys behind us." Uh, that is probably the route to take there. It's probably not to yell mm-hmm. at the fans because the fans, have fear, theoretically, you're in a big market. Uh, they you're have, in last place. Yeah. How are you going to sit there and say, fuck you guys if you don't support us? Exactly. You fuck can. you if you don't support the last place Boston Red Sox. All right. Okay. Suck a dick. Yes. We're going to we're going to go on a run here. Especially when in the last week, like you had a moment that went extremely viral for you not chasing after a ball that fell behind you. Like read the Can't room. Can't do it. You know, and I think the other thing that was weirdly sticking out. He's the only player ahead of the trade deadline that said we trust Heim and said it publicly during an interview. That didn't come out from anybody else, from any of the other players. I think you look at Vasquez's comments and you look at Bogart's comments. They never said we didn't trust Heim. They kind of said, we don't know what direction. We're kind of confused. I thought it was interesting for Duran to go out and say that. It just kind of, it's a lot of that young player. Did he say we or I? Uh, I, I think we, I think he said we. Yeah, I, it was on was, the ESPN post. Yeah. yeah, he was like, we have a lot of faith in Heim. You know, we think he's the man who can do the job, whatever. That's a, that's one of, if not the last guy that should be speaking on behalf of the team. It, exactly. And that's just what it is. It's like, you are not the guy who should be saying stuff like that. Leave it to Bogarts. Leave it to Vasquez before he got dealt. You know, J.D. Martinez, Nate Evaldi. JD, those are the guys yeah. that should speak for the group. And not to mention yeah. in that scenario, it's one thing to be agreeing if, if Vasquez, if Xander, if JD have come out and said, hey, we're behind Heim, whatever he says, we, we believe in what he's doing. And then he just echoes that in, in an interview. It's another thing to be kind of not going against, you know, something that kind of Vasquez talked about where he wasn't really sure what the hell was going on. Uh, you, can, you can certainly hear uh, it with what Heim is saying that he it kind of feels like people don't trust him because otherwise you don't come out publicly and say that my door is open to any of the players. Because GMs, theoretically, you can, I can talk to a GM. And when I was playing, we can talk to a GM whatever the hell we wanted. The, the door's always open regardless. But um, he understands there's questions surrounding his moves. And that's why he's saying that. And, and I think he's doing a good job of that. But for a young guy to, you know, to, you know, and I felt like I didn't have to handle the media all that often. But it, it's, it's very strange to see uh, this type of quote come, come, come out from a guy that, Again, had that viral moment. The team he's surrounded by is not having a good month. The veterans on the team echoing a different sentiment about front office. It's just, it strikes me as odd. Um, and I would say I have nothing against Jaron Duran. I, and I hope that uh, I don't have really anything negative to say about him regardless. But I would say that right now, if it were me and I still had guys in that clubhouse, uh, text messages probably would have been sent out to asking, what do we got on this guy? Uh, just out of curiosity, I, I have not. Again, I do not know the man personally, so I'm not saying anything personally against the guy. Uh, but uh, on the back end, I certainly would be asking people because these are these comments come off as comments from I would hear from guys in years past that I won't mention by name that I I didn't particularly like. Who, who and like he like has Pat? a history of. Wait, hold on. Who didn't like that? <laughs> Go ahead, Tyler. Who didn't Continue you like Pat? <laughs> what? Which one of your teammates did you fucking hate? Oh, we're not going to get involved in that. You know the you can Pat, you can say it. we're in a safe space. I mean, they're probably retired too by now. No, I'm sure they are retired too by now. But uh, listen, one of the things that I, I compliment you on a daily basis, not, definitely not a daily basis, that'd be outrageous, but I compliment you quite frequently, <laughs> Jared, on uh, is that you've created the top Red Sox podcast in all of the country. Uh, so mm-hmm. it's not like we're saying this and you know 20 people are going to hear it. Uh, so I'm not. You think people are going to hear it if you say it here, Pat? I think people are going to hear it. Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. Can we but get? Do a I hint? know? Do I know the the player personally? Do I have a relationship with the player? Um, any player or players that I did not like? Um, I know of at least one that you definitely had a relationship with. Uh, at least one, maybe two. Two come to mind that I didn't particularly like. Okay. Yeah. Actually, I think I know one of them. Did, did was his name mentioned on this podcast? I can't be talking about that. All right, I know one of them. You should know the other two. 
Yeah. I mean, I'll just say, uh, I, I mean, I hate Robbie Scott. He was a fucking asshole, that guy. I never, I don't think I ever told that story. I feel like, I feel like I dabbled in telling the story and then I never told it. Tell it. <laughs> Talk to I, us, Jared. Jake, do you remember if I ever told this story, the Robbie Scott story? I don't remember hearing it. I think we got into it, but you told a story of a ride home or something like that, right? No, this this was this was something different. Uh, yeah, I, I feel like enough time has gone by. I mean, he's not. On, I don't even know if he's still in professional baseball anymore. Honestly, I'm pretty uh, sure you followed me on Twitter. So, did you really? Um, I think so. I'm a all right, it's the, the Robbie Scott story. I don't. I can't believe I never told the story. Maybe I, I can't remember. Uh, so this must have been what 2017. It was the roast of David Ortiz at the House of Blues, and. I'm sitting like if if you've been in the House of Blues, it's like the front of the stage is here. If you're watching this on YouTube and then alongside there is like a bar and I was at the bar. With Katie Nolan and the Red Sox were sitting in front of the stage, like in that area. So and so like I'm, I'm sitting on like the side of the room, the stage is on my left. The bar is behind me and the bathrooms you have to walk by me uh, are on my right. So uh, the Red Sox had just played in Kansas City and Robbie Scott, I can't remember if it was a grand slam or just a home run. Robbie Scott gave up a home run to Salvador Perez uh, on a fastball. And if I'm remembering the at bat correctly, he threw him like, Double di- like it was a double digit pitch at bat. Threw him like eleven fastballs in a row, and he hit the home run on a fastball. He was just only fastballs and didn't mix it up, whatever. And uh, I looked at Salvador Perez's numbers against fastballs, and he was hitting like three thirty with like a nine something OPS against fastballs. So my whole thing was like, why the fuck did you only throw him fastballs when he crushed his fastballs? You're a lefty, and he was hitting righty. So I had never met. Robbie Scott before. At least I don't remember meeting him before that. Um, and so he gets up from where like the Red Sox players were sitting and he walks by me and stops and like we're ta- like, you know, introduces himself. We're talking, having this conversation. And I brought that up. I was like, I was like, let me ask you. Um, I was like, are you? I was like, is like, I don't even remember who was catching if it was Vasquez or if it was someone else. Um, I was like, are you calling any of those pitches? Like, did you shake off at all? Like, do you have any say in that? Because I was like, he hits like 330 against fastballs and all you threw is fastballs. Like that has like, it, this is the big leagues. I'm sure like people have to have notes on this. Like, it just seems so obvious to not do that in that spot. And he was like, no, I just, I just throw what they tell me to throw. And I was like, all right, interesting. I was like, I'm just at, like, I'm not like talking shit. Like I just, I'm genuinely just asking. So he walks to the bathroom comes he has to walk by me again to go back to his seat and he stops for a second time and he was like hey like my wife my girlfriend whoever it was like has like this blog and like because he knew because that year i think robbie ross came on with his wife Brittany, and they came on together and they were like you know talking about their like robbie's career but then also like what his wife does and like their charitable stuff and I think he saw that with, with Robbie Ross. And he was like, hey, like my wife is a blogger. Like, I think we want to like kind of like do the same thing. Like we want to come on together and like we can pr- like promote her stuff. I was like, yeah, I was like, just hit me up, whatever. Like we'll get it done. And then he goes back to his seat. And uh, I can't, I, like I'm being dead serious. I don't remember which reliever it was that told me, but it was a full year later because the, the roast of Ortiz was in 17 and during 2018 was when someone on the Red Sox was like, what's the deal with you and Robbie Scott? And I was like, uh, I don't know. I was, like, I was like, I've only met him once. And uh, he's like, yeah, like he said that he met you one time and that you like followed him into the bathroom, like trying to get information out of him. And I was like, are you fucking kidding me? I was like, what? He's like, yeah, he like said that like he said that you like followed him into the bathroom and kept trying to get information out of him. And I was like, you got to be fucking kidding me. So he was still on the Red Sox at the time. And 
I went on the next episode of Section 10 and I was like, uh, yeah, like fuck Robbie Scott, like this and that. Like t- basically I didn't tell, I didn't say the story what happened. I was like, just like fuck this motherfucker. And I was like, I'm, I was like, if he doesn't apologize to me, then I'm telling this story on the podcast. Like fuck him. I don't care. So I get a call from uh, Red Sox PR and they were like, what's going on with you and Robbie Scott? Like what happened? Like, like his agent just called me and uh, they're like freaking out and they don't know what's going on. And like, did he do something illegal? I was like, no, he's just a fucking asshole and like a liar. Uh, and I told him the story and he's like, what if I like, you know, I can arrange a conversation with you two guys and like you guys can like sort it out. So I, I have BP passes, like I'm standing on the field and I'm waiting for fucking Robbie Scott to come out of the dugout to take a walk with me and like explain what the fuck happened. So we take a walk up the right field line together. And once we're away from everyone, I give him the out. And I was like, hey, man, listen, like, I know that like at the time you were one of the new guys and you probably thought that like shitting on me would get you clout in, in the clubhouse, not realizing that like they actually like me. So like you saying that shit and lying about it, like that looks bad on you. Uh, you put yourself in a real bad spot here. And he's like, no, man, like it wasn't even li-. like he didn't even apologize. Like he denied it. And I was just like, all right, dude. I was like, was like if you're going to fucking like deny that, like I, or like say that you didn't remember that it happened or like deny, I was like, I, I have no interest in this conversation beyond that. Um, but yeah, that was, that was really it. He just full blown fucking like made up a story to that had to have been what happened. Like he probably thought like these guys don't like Jared. So I'm going to embellish. Like we met, we were at the House of Blues. He did go to the bathroom. I, I, I stayed put. I mean, Katie Nolan, pretty reputable person. I was talking to her the entire time, never moved my position from where I was. Uh, so, yeah, that's, that's the Robbie Scott story. I still to this day, like when I think about it, I'm like, what a fucking asshole to like, cause like that's, that's like fucking with someone's career. Like if, if you're, if, if they believed him, if they thought that I was someone that would fucking follow a player into the bathroom trying to get information, like, are you fucking kidding me? Like if, if those guys believe that, and just cut me off and never explained why, then, then what happens to me? Especially in 2018 of all seasons, if I get cut off from, from the fucking clubhouse because of that fucking dickhead. So that's the Robbie Scott story. <laughs> felt good to get out. I'll be honest. I, it felt good to, to get I, I don't know why I was protecting the guy. I don't know why. I mean, I, I guess I was just trying to take the high road. Uh, but I mean, it's, it's been three, four years now, but I I don't even know if where he's playing baseball, if he's playing baseball anywhere. A note, but I just checked 2019 was his last uh, year in pro ball. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like while he was with the team, I was like, I'm not going to like make this a shit storm for you guys, like talking to like Red Sox PR or whatever. Uh, But now it's like, fuck it. Like you, like he did, he did not even apologize. Like he, he basically tried to like tell like a completely different story of what happened. And I was like, bro, like, the person that told me this is not going to lie. Like, I, like he's not going to like tell me this fake story just to like cause drama. Like you said this shit. So either apologize or fuck you. And now it's out there. If he has social media, he's about to get blown up tomorrow morning. Oh, he has yeah, Twitter. Fuck. I just should see if I didn't. He did indeed unfollow me, which he did. He is wow, not he, so pe- Okay. Pat, did you have a relationship with him over the years? Yeah, so I originally was I was I was very much so in Jared's camp here prior to even knowing Jared. I didn't like Robbie um coming up. He was a, he was he was uh a year I don't know if he was a year older than I was, but I know he was like always like a level above me until we went to, went to to double A together. To his credit, he was always pretty successful. Um in to a, a, a pretty high degree to be honest with you. Um, but he was always dominated double A. Yeah, he was always salty about it. Like, you know, when he when he, I understand why he's upset that he wasn't called up earlier than he was, but like at the end of the day, as you grow in this game and as you become an adult, which me and him both at that time were I, I guess you say young adults at the time. I think we're both in our early twenties, but like you understand that like this this is a business, you know, like you signed out of independent ball, uh, and you got guys that are pitching comparable to you who had fat signing bonuses and who are on the 40 man who are do like 
sorry, bud. You, you're just not, it's just not going to happen for you. And it eventually did. Good for him because he did pitch out of his mind. Um, but he was. He was always salty about all that stuff. And it, it wore on people. I was a big, I'm a fairly positive person. Um, uh, and I just, anyone that was really negative, I just stayed away from all the time. Uh, Robbie, I, I was, I was fairly close with in AAA. I did like it. I like, he actually introduced me to the blueberry, uh, iced coffee I get. I don't know if we're sponsored by a coffee brand, so I won't say the name, but, uh, no, we're, we're sponsored by a coffee brand that, uh, is, is all brands of coffee. Oh yes, you're right. So you, you're right. Um, yeah. so, uh, I have, uh, the Dunkin' Donuts, um, uh, blueberry coffee, which I, I really like in the, in the summer. It's a nice coffee. It's nice. I thought it was weird in the beginning, but then it grew on me. So I do credit for that, but. I don't know, man. He was just, there was something not right there. And then, like, we stayed in touch a little bit after baseball. And then randomly, I, I went on Twitter. I saw he unfollowed me, which honestly, I'm not, I don't care. Like, I really don't give a shit. Um, I was trying on social media towards the end of my career because I knew the end of my career was coming and I had to do something. Um, so, a lot of the stuff that I posted was kind of throwing shit at the wall and hoping something would eventually stick. And I'd kind of learn the craft of social media. Which I've done, a, I've done an all right job of over the last couple of years now, kind of figuring out what I do. You have, um, but in the beginning, like, yeah, I look back at some of my stuff, and they were like cringy. Like, if you went back on my Instagram, which could be a fun thing. No, for this, this is kind of this, this could be a fun thing for the podcast if we for maybe next episode. <laughs> if you go back to like, I was posting all the time, just trying to find something that would stick when I was with the Pirates. Um, it's you got to scroll back pretty far because I do I do post quite a bit, but. Um, I, you know, I was just trying to find something, and a lot of people unfollowed me for my career. Uh, a lot of a lot of a lot of guys were just like uh, fed up with it. Um, really? I, yeah. Which I can, anyone yeah. that you were particularly close with? No, no. Like you weren't like crapping on guys, right? No, I I was just I, you could theoretically I could understand on Instagram uh, because people that annoy me on Twitter that I I'm not going to unfollow because they're a friend of mine or something like that. I still don't want to show somewhat of support. I just mute. Uh, Instagram didn't have that that feature yet, so I can understand people being like, "Oh, fuck this guy." I, I'm just different with social. Like, I'm just gonna keep scrolling if I don't really enjoy what I'm seeing. I'm not gonna get annoyed with it. Uh, but yeah, I if, I, if I unfollow you, it's it's fuck you. You're dead to me. Yeah. Because um, even even if like I I like you, but it's like I fall like I'll do the same thing. Like I'll just mute you if I'm really not interested in what you have to say. But I still like you as a person. Exactly. I, trying on social media was considered stupid in Major League Baseball clubhouses unless you were David Price. Uh, it was just, it, yeah. it was looked upon as, what are you doing? Like, you should be big on social media because of your play on the field, not because you're trying to be bigger on social media. Uh, and so I kind of, again, I wanted a backup plan for my end of my career. I saw what guys like you were doing, Jared, uh, and thought that'd be something more beneficial to me than having to go get a job that I'd hated. So I started mm -hmm. I started the process early, and uh, I I certainly took my licks from people inside the clubhouse. But God bless me, I kept going. <laughs> You're just uh, you get golden retriever brand big time. I don't know. You're always happy. Yeah. You can you can piss the bed, piss the floor, and it's like you know what? He's still wagging his tail though. Yeah. I don't think I've ever seen you in a bad mood. Mm, it's hard to get me in a bad mood. Um, like, uh, it, it's it's very difficult. You guys got to I don't even know an example of what you'd have to do. Uh, you can. What's that like to just be happy all the time? It's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. I love. I like. I I left baseball. I fucking did something that my that theoretically my parents probably didn't want me to do, which was not do a you know a, a settling nine to five job. I invested. Mm -hmm. I took my bank account to zero. I had zero dollars. I had to borrow money from my parents to pay for my credit card bill when I bought Green Rock, um, and fucking made it work since then. So and I, and I'm doing okay for myself. So uh, doing great. Yeah, yeah. Six million dollars a year is fucking way better than just okay. Well, yeah, and a down year. Um, but mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> mm. no. But uh, yeah, listen, I've always been a happy guy. Nothing to, be, nothing to be upset about. Mine is sometimes when I don't show up on the podcast that people show on me on Twitter. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think now you've conditioned them to... Like, I, I, I think when you first came on board, everyone was like, fuck yeah, like Pat's like a permanent co-host. But I think you've conditioned them to be like a surprise now. Mm -hmm. I don't think anyone expects you for every single episode moving forward. And I think now it's just like a special treat. Like when you get Pat, it's like, oh, cool. It's a Pat Light episode versus like, 
thanks for finally fucking showing up. Like you're supposed to be here every fucking week. You're too good for us. Blah blah blah. So yeah, I, I that's at least that's how I look at it. You're you're a like it's like oh it's a Pat episode. This is this is exciting. Well, I I saw a few comments throughout the uh, last couple months of me not showing up, where people were being like. You know, Jared stuck his neck out for Pat to get him this gig, all this stuff. And I, I obviously we're not going to dive into the logistics of our deals. But um, when I said last episode that I, I wasn't looking for another full time gig, I did see some people resonate with that being like, oh, OK, so, you know, this is kind of what Pat is on the show. He's, you know, like you said, like a part time co-host uh, does have other things going on. Um, a lot of things. Yeah. Now you might be owning the Angels. You know, what? I'd love to. I'd love to. It, it doesn't. I. <laughs> Because I'm the most optimistic lunatic you'll ever meet, I actually uh. called my account on it, and not that I could do it myself. You still have to, you have to like, you'd have to get like a hedge fund. You have to get like, like Alex Rodriguez did. You have to go get J.P. Morgan to go get the money for you, essentially, and raise it with a mm. bunch of people. You just might be like a Derek Jeter, where you're the face of the of the thing, where you only own a percent of the damn team. Um, mm. But I actually called my account on. Not that I was going to do it recently, and I don't really want the Angels. I'd prefer an East Coast team, but. Um, I anything that is possibility to me, I always see if I can try to pull it off. Uh, Would you buy the Rays if they were available? If that was the only team that you could get, and they were like, you you have to buy the Rays. Uh oh. <laughs> um, it's really not my style of baseball. Like, like I no. I love, but you'd be the owner. Like, you can change the narrative. Like, hey, we spend here now. Big market raise. I Pat could, L I, is the new owner in town. Pat L could be the new owner in town, but I'm I'm I I have to operate on the what I know of the raise and based off the business aspect of it, I might not be able to spend that much money. Unless I'm just yeah, you know, got crazy money where I can say, fuck it, I don't even care if we lose money this year. I'm gonna go get <laughs> all these great players. Um no, I, I I'd be surprised. Interesting. I, it might I might do it if it's the only team I could buy. But I'm gonna do it. I think uh if if you put yourself on the broadcast mm-hmm. for ratings. Oh, electric. Sign some players, trade for some players, put Pat L yeah. on the broadcast with Pete B. And next thing you know, it's the Tampa Bay Razor can't miss television. Everyone's tuning in to watch the Rays, even if they don't like the Razors, because the broadcast is so damn good. Um Yeah. Jake's Jake's takes on the trade deadline. Yeah, well, first of all, I was just going to say, if you bet on a, a topic tonight for this podcast on the DraftKings Sportsbook, if you bet that we were going to do 20 minutes on Robbie Scott, I think we would have <laughs> a ton of money. A ton of money. <laughs> a ton of money. Um, a but lot yeah, the deadline, I mean, I think <laughs> after we traded Vasquez, you thought we're going to be sellers, but... I don't know. It, it feels it feels pretty nice to have a first baseman. I'll I'll say that um, a guy who can actually play first is sick. Not that Bob has been too bad lately, but just a guy who like knows how to field the position and has done it for a number of years and can hit pretty solidly. Like that that feels pretty comfortable. And like you've been tweeting recently about Franchi. I mean, making three hours a game and going one for seven hundred is. Very unsustainable. So yeah, not not seeing him anymore is like I'm I'm pretty pumped about that. Yeah, Franchi getting demoted was one of the it was one of the bigger stories of the week that didn't get the uh, pop that it deserved from the fan base because everyone was focused on all the other trades and everything. But you want to talk about addition by sub, uh, subtraction. Franchi getting demoted and Jake Diekman getting traded to the White Sox for the fucking jerk off dude. It's it's what a what a difference that makes. Um, especially I is Josh Taylor alive, Tyler? What the fuck is going on there? They shut him down because he again was, he just he hasn't really started back up like full go. Uh, when the they, fuck did when was the last time that he pitched? It's been about probably a month now. Uh, where what they, the fuck? Yeah, he just the velocity's down. It, it's just not what it was, and he hasn't really got anywhere close to pitching again. So this I, is just a lost season for him. It, it's trending in that direction. I think on the bright side, you have James Paxson. He threw a simulated game, so you could really start to maybe dream on that. But that's probably September. You know, he's going to. And walk is going four. <laughs> yep, in a rebounding tomorrow. Correct. Tomorrow's what? Thursday? Yep. 
I I will say when the with the trade deadline, I think there are some negatives to how they went about this stuff. The fact that they didn't get under the luxury tax was a problem for me, if I'm being real with you, because I felt like, you know, as we've seen these other teams like the Dodgers, the reason they paid Mookie bets when they did was because they were going to push in over the luxury tax for a couple of years. They felt like it was the perfect time. And as we saw with the Yankees this year, they've pushed the chips in because last year they reset and they realized this is their window. So, hey, you push all your chips in. The Red Sox look like they got caught in between. Didn't exactly love the returns they would have got for Martinez and Evaldi and said, all right, we'll hold on. But you're still over the luxury tax. So that's where I look at the Eric Hosmer deal. And I like it a lot because you're paying nothing. But you could have taken some of that money, got a Luis Camposano or something like that got a catcher of the future. Maybe it's a lesser prospect, but got something with it. And at the same time, you've burnt one of those years on the clock where you didn't push all your chips in to win a World Series. Because I feel like I like the roster where it is. I think it's a more functioning roster. If you could have added a Tyler Maley or one more piece, because your rotation right now is still rough. Like, I, I think they'll be in the conversation down the stretch for a postseason spot. But, you know, Michael Walker, Rich Hill and Cutter Crawford will fill out the rest of your rotation. And I, I'm not trying to disrespect any of those guys. They're all back end guys. That's going to be really hard to compete with teams like the Rays or really the Mariners, especially after they win got Luis Castillo. It feels like they just didn't go far enough this year. And I don't know. I, that worries me about next year and whether they're going to try to reset again. And I think that could impact other conversations, other talks, Bogarts, all this different stuff. I, I don't feel like they poured enough into this year. I was okay with them buying and selling, that was the approach I wanted them to go with. But it felt like there were marginal gains in each direction. Not enough for me personally to feel like it was a super successful deadline. Yeah, that's the word. Marginal. Like anytime that you know, I've been asked, do the Red Sox even get better? Marginally. They marginally got better. They did not. Like they had Franchi Cordero and they had fucking Christian Arroyo and Jackie Bradley Jr. Defensively, obviously, is outstanding. Um, but Jeter offensively Downs. was, yeah, Jeter Downs. And you had all these guys that were playing out. Bobby Dahlbeck's playing out of position. He's not a first baseman. Like, he's not a first baseman. He's, he's a third baseman. Um, like, how many guys did the Red Sox have playing out of position this year uh, before they finally were like, hey, we need another outfielder. Hey, maybe it would be nice to have a first baseman for the first time since Mitch Moreland was here. Like he got traded what during uh 2020? Yeah, Jason Rosario and Hudson Potts. There w- was there a trade deadline in 2020? Yeah, th- those those were the pieces that came back that year. But I can't remember if they traded them before the season or after. No, it was during the season. It was at the deadline. That's fucking insane that they had a trade deadline that year. <laughs> it's like played 30 games as a month. Um uh but yeah. It's uh they did something like you can't say they didn't do anything. You can't say that they didn't address needs because they did. Um, I think with with Chris Sale, God knows what's going to happen with with James Paxton. God knows what's going to happen. Uh, no help in the bullpen, which, you know, I think we're so far removed from that. Like originally we had we had like a little uh, infection. And then we got our arm cut off and then we got our leg cut off. And it's like, well, who cares about that infection? Like your fucking arm and leg is cut off, dude. But this season and the troubles that this team has had all started with having no closer, no back end of the bullpen help. Um, you know, you were having guys blow games left and right. And that was the difference maker, I would say, through May. And then you got into June, you went 20 and 6. People are not talking about the, the bullpen as much anymore. And then you have a dog shit July and uh, your back end of the bullpen isn't really addressed. But in a way, by the way, isn't it crazy that Bloom came out and said uh, the only thing that he said about his trade targets were we need some right handed relievers. And then he got a first baseman, an outfielder and a fucking jerk off catcher. That, 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 it's just weird. It just feels like they were unfinished. And I think Bloom basically told you that as well. He said, you know, I expected a lot to make a lot more deals today and it didn't happen. Um, I don't love that response because we've heard it a couple of different times now. It's just if you're I understand moving off Vasquez qualifying offer, you want your value. Cool. If your goal is to make the postseason and you're going to stay over the luxury tax, you better damn well put in the effort to try and win or at least make a deep playoff run. 
it doesn't feel like that. It feels like they kind of reshuffled the cards and, you know, improved a little bit and admitted, yeah, we made a mistake in the outfield. We should have got Tommy Fan before the year started. We should have got yeah. a first baseman. How about you go ahead and say, all right, we should have made, you know, we should have fixed our error of not doing something to replace the arm that Sale cost us when he went down. You didn't fix that mistake. And, and that's where I'm sitting there and I'm like, I like the lineup. I think the lineup's going to be really good if everyone can get healthy. But the rotation, it's duct tape. And, and you're really hoping it can, can kind of stick together. And props to Cutter Crawford. That dude is fucking balling out right now, what he's mm-hmm. doing. But we're watching Ryan Brazier and Hirokazu Sawamura in the seventh. Like pretty right. frequently. You need to start funneling some of these triple A arms. And realistically, you shouldn't even have to do that. You should have at least a bullpen arm or another starter in this mix. And it's just you yeah, need like, to go all the way. Like Rich Hill today comes back. Um, didn't have it. And I think it's, it's it goes beyond he didn't have it to. He missed a lot of time. He's 42 years old. Is he going to have it? Before the season's over, is he? You know? gonna, is he really ever going to have it against elite lineups? Like it's one thing when you're facing the A's and you're like, "All right, let's get by." When you're facing the fucking Astros, good luck. Uh, like you need good stuff to get through that stuff, and then you lose Brian Bayo today. Who knows how long that will be? We'll find out tomorrow. But injuries have you know really did a number on this team. I just I felt like if you could have got them a pitcher, at least one on the rotation of the bullpen you'd feel way better about them moving forward. It's just, there's still holes. And if you're going to stay over the luxury tax, I just don't know why you don't solve those problems. You, you can't leave any holes if that's the case. Or in my opinion, it's just a bad job by the front office. So I'd put them at a C. I like their moves. You just still don't have much of a direction either because you didn't go get that controllable piece. You know, you got Her- yeah. Eric Hosmer, but like we said, there's a fair chance he's dealt over the offseason because Tristan Cassis will be up. Uh, mm-hmm. And we know, good mentor, they, same high school, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you know, it's all been said so far, but Sean Murphy. Oh, yeah, I didn't realize that. Yeah, that, that's a cool note. So it's a little of a mentor thing. But with the Sean Murphy stuff, I get it. I get why you didn't. It would have cost two out of your top three. I have a hard time parting with Bayo, Meyer, and Cassis. Two out of three of that group's a hard sell. But you could have went yeah. and got another controllable piece to be around. And you have all these questions for the offseason that you just punted. And that's why if I'm Heim Bloom and that first meeting I'm having with Xander Bogarts, I'm saying, hey, we need to figure out an extension before the season ends because the amount of things we have to figure out right now is ridiculous. Yeah, the, the amount of things that need to be addressed in the offseason, it it's a, it's, a, it's a large list, and I would like to take one of those things off the list right now if we can figure something out with you. And, and the biggest one for, the, you know, at the moment, obviously Devers is the guy who's most important to extend long-term, but Bogarts is going to be a free agent. Get it done now and then go from there. And that sets you up for Devers and that sets you up to have an offseason where when you need to get guys to come here and you have Xander Bogarts who two days ago said, I don't know what direction we're kind of going in here. I'm really not sure. You better get that guy on your side or you're going to have a hard time selling someone and having him recruit guys like he did Trevor Story this past winter. Yeah. The Xander situation is going to be fascinating because uh, it's, it's almost like the Red Sox have learned from their past mistakes. I think what you have in Xander is what you had in John Lester. And what I mean by that is you have a player who came up through this system, has only known this organization, has won championships here, wants to build a legacy here, and you're going to have to tear the jersey off their back to make them leave. The Red Sox tore that jersey off the back of John Lester. They did not tear the jersey off the back of Xander Bogarts, which is smart because John Lester came on Section 10 and I asked him, do you think that if the Red Sox did not trade you in the trade deadline of 2014, that would have increased your chances of coming back in free agency? And he said, yes. Yeah. They're learning from their past mistakes. If they are serious, and I said this, I said this to Heim, by the way. I said, I'm going to read into it if Xander is still here after uh, 6 p.m. on Tuesday. If Xander is still here, and this was before Xander, I think it was that night. Uh, I think it was that night that Xander said, they told me that they're not trading me. Um, So I said this before I knew that. 
uh, I said, I'm going to read into it. If Xander is still here at 6 p.m. on Tuesday, um, that I trust that the Red Sox are going to make an honest effort to re-sign him. Because what else, what other reason would he still be here? I get that there would be like a fan uh, uproar. Or, uh, they would revolt. Um. But yeah, if they could, I, I, trust me, I, I think there's like a 8% chance that they get it done before the season's over. Uh, I'd be happy to just get it done before Christmas at this point. Um, I just, I'm looking at it and I agree, Boris is going to make life hell. Like the chances of him letting him sign that deal is very, very low. But they have said that their ears are open. You'd probably have to pay well above market. Bloom's not doing that. We know that. Um just lay the foundation and make sure the relationship is in a place when the end of the season comes where it feels a lot better than it does right now. Because right now, like we say, Heim Bloom's answering through the media like, I'm not going to comment on what Bogart said. We're going to talk about it. It shouldn't feel like that by the end of the year. And I hope it doesn't, because if it does, it's going to feel like a hard time to think he's going to want to come back here, especially after being insulted by them through offers. And like you traded another one of his best friends, the guy who sat next to him on the plane. Every single time. Mm. Yeah. Well, I guess he can just have a dark and stormy on the plane instead. Does that help? Yeah, because I think we all know the power of an MVP. They make good teams great. And the folks at Gosling's Rum know a little something about MVPs. All the most valuable fans and super fans across the world who have made the Gosling's Dark and Stormy, one of the most popular cocktails on the planet. That delicious combo of smooth Gosling's Black Seal Rum and spicy Gosling's Stormy Ginger Beer cannot be beat for a summertime cocktail. Visit goslingsrum.com to get Gosling's products delivered straight to your doorstep and get $15 off your order of Gosling's Rum, Ginger Beer, or Dark and Stormy cans using the promo code Draft Kings. That is promo code Draft Kings at goslingsrum.com. 21 and over only. Please drink responsibly. Um, were there any other takeaways from uh, this Houston Astros series other than it's very funny that the Red Sox have two series victories over the Houston Astros and zero over the AL East as an entire division? That's the big takeaway. Yeah. It, it, it's weird. I, I think the player wise, it's Cutter Crawford, just what he's doing right now to be for him to be the arm out of, you know, Josh Winkowski and even Brian Bayo this year to pop like this. That's a massive find. It's a prop to the Red Sox pitching line. Like last eight games, seven starts. Obviously, he was working as an opener in one of them. 272 ERA, 307 FIP in 43 innings. 8.8 K per nine, 1.9 walk per nine. I'm not trying to crap on Josh Winkowski, but like that's what starter, you know, peripherals and numbers overall look like in that kind of spot. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think I think if you're banking on someone to step up and hopefully be that guy over the next two months that can maybe be a three ish kind of guy, it's him. It's asking a lot, but. He's Maz to seems to think that the Bayo groin injury is a death sentence. Uh, they didn't seem that down on it. We'll see. I think the innings limit will play a part, but I don't know. I, don't, I think if anything, maybe it gives them a little bit of a breather from some of those innings and they can use them, but who knows? Yeah. We'll see what it is. I will say, shout out to Christian Vasquez, who noticed the injury, was trying to get Cora's attention. Cora had already noticed but that's how much he cared about his boy. He's trying to signal Alex mm. Gore from the Astros dugout to let him know he saw something that was off. Mm. Pat, you ever have a leg injury? Yep, tore my left hamstring. In- oh, yeah. 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 Motherfucker tore his hamstring, and the Red Sox were like, get out there and chuck baseballs, <laughs> Pat. Twice. Take some fucking Advil. Get out there and win us a ball game, Pat. What I mean, was, I, what was I wrong can't with even ask you this Pat? question. I tore it. You it fucking deficient? tore it. No, but like to do it multiple times was it just a weak I know, hamstring. I, I, I tore it while running. Uh, no, my hamstring was great. 
that was actually the reason, theoretically, that I got kept getting thrown out there was because I passed the strength tests uh, oh. when they. So instead of sending you for an MRI, which is very expensive, uh, they do all these little tests on you to see if they think it might be torn. I passed those tests. The only test I couldn't pass was pitching in a real game. Uh, I'd get three pitches, and by the third pitch, my I felt like I was going. My hamstring was a rubber band. I felt like it was going to snap. Uh, and by the, I, it happened twice where I got three pitches in and had to be pulled. And on the second time, they finally sent me to Boston. And uh, I remember the doctor coming in. I'm mean, like, I can't wait the fucking guy, can't wait what this guy's going to fucking say. You know, what the hell is wrong with me? And I was like, So do you know what's wrong with me, Doc? He's like, Yeah, it's pretty easy to tell. I go, Really? What is it? He goes, Yeah, you tore your hamstring. It's like, no fucking way. <laughs> so, yeah, I have injured my leg before. Red Sox medicals, baby. Oh, yeah, baby. Yeah, I, I was going to ask, like, how difficult is it, um, you know, to pitch with a leg injury, but your, your hamstring was torn. Of course it was difficult. Yeah, I mean, and it's on my land leg, like. You're, you know, obviously everyone knows when you're pushing, you're using mainly quads. When you're landing and stopping yourself, you're using hamstrings. So I probably could have dealt with it on my right leg, but I can't deal with it on my land. Uh, any, any injury, the thing I can speak to with any injury is if it's in your head, it's going to fuck with you until you trust it. Uh, so I, I don't know how bad this injury is. It seems like a groin injury. Um, you know, obviously your groin is used when you're pitching. Uh, so... Uh, if it's in his head, it can fuck with him. So I it, and when you're it's, Dollar Street parking lot, huh? Hmm? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's really the only thing I can tell you is you know I remember I remember throwing in the middle of games and feeling a little something in my elbow. I never hurt my elbow once, but feeling a little something in my elbow, and then the next fastball or the next splitter, which is supposed to be known to be bad for your, your elbow, ah, eased off a little bit. It wasn't the best pitch because I was like, ah, I don't really want to throw my arm out here. So. That's really what goes on out there. At least it went on for me. But then again, I'm sitting here in 2017 getting made fun of for trying to do social media because I knew my career was coming to an abrupt halt. So what do I know? Mm. Good call by you. Great call. Great call by you. That's excellent foresight. Mm -hmm. um, the Clark's Ketchup Series MVP. You got to drizzle some ketchup here. I think I have a weird pick. Why don't you start us off, A Tyler? weird pick? Go ahead, Tyler. Oh, God, I can't see you guys. Can you see me? Yeah. Okay, my computer just locked. I'm going to go Tanner Houck. Tanner Houck! Two big saves, obviously an inning and two-thirds in one of them, both one-run games for him to step up and pick up the bullpen and be that guy in the back. I think he stopped you from disaster. And while Rafi had a big game and Jaron Duran had a big game, Cutter had one big game, he was the one player where it really felt like it carried over across two. Patrick? Yeah, I'm going to piggyback. Um, and for a little bit of a different reason, um, and the main reason being how big of a weak point that particular part of our bullpen, which has been weak all year, no, no doubt, uh, but that particular part of our bullpen has been uh, notoriously weak. Um, so, uh, you know, having that against a really good Houston Astros team, uh, and I can tell you going out for a multiple save, multiple innings save, I mean, uh, it's not that easy. You know, you really don't want to have to deal with five outs. You really only want to deal with three. Uh, so uh, I'll give it to him as well. Specifically, last time I had to do this, which feels like months ago, um, I like to go my, you know, my uh, random ones where I give it to the guy sitting in section 10. <laughs> um, oh! And uh, that's not, hasn't been received well. So we're going to stick with players this time. <laughs> Jake? Uh, I got Cutter Crawford. Mm. I think there wasn't, wasn't a lot of huge offensive numbers this series. I think Bob had three hits, which might have led the team in hits for the series. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I, you expect Ovaldi to have a good start on Monday. Crawford, again, just shows up six innings against the Astros, one run. I feel like got to give it to him. He won us that game. Um. So one for Cutter Crawford, two for Tanner Houck, and then it comes to me. What do you got, Jared? 
Oh. <laughs> I think he'll be able to hear you guys too because of the the new switchboard. He does have a baby though. Please, Coley. Why is there an echo? Oh no, it's not. Your call has been oh, forwarded to Coley. The first time, the first time that we're able to use <coughs> the new soundboard and he doesn't answer because I am voting for Raphael Devers, Clark's Ketchup Series MVP, um, simply because obviously uh, the game that he returns Homer, RBI double. I believe, were those the only runs driven in that game? Yeah, that was it. So he single-handedly won a game. And just his presence of being back in the lineup made things feel different. Like, it, it felt like the Red Sox again. Um, it Him? felt like... It, before when when he went down it almost felt like he got he got traded and he just wasn't on the team anymore and it's like this is what the red sox are they're a fucking abomination so i felt um, like him and jaron duran had like basically the same game yeah they did you know jaron duran two run shot obviously rbi double you win three two bogarts double solo shot you win two one Mm. Mm -hmm. uh I mean, I we we have to wait for him to call back. What do you think he'd pick? It'd be outside the box. Yeah, he's gonna pick like fucking like Brian Bayo for firing up the boys. <laughs> <laughs> Christian Vasquez. Yeah, he could pick Vasquez. He's gonna pick Tommy Pham. I mean, Tommy Pham. I don't know who he's gonna pick. All I know is that normally when I do call him after a Red Sox series win and he doesn't answer, it's because he's being family guy, but he'll text me immediately and be like, by the way, I can't, I can't talk about my pick is so-and-so. Unless, unless he's trying to play by the rules with this, this barstool situation. That doesn't and, sound like Coley, though. No, and you still, I think, would have got a text about that. Yeah, that's true. He would have at least texted yeah, his say, pick I can't by do now. this right now. You think he's sleeping? He's not sleeping. Coley never sleeps. That seems unlikely. Yeah, I was part of that podcast for a very short period of time. Uh, normal I call Pete? podcasts were not a thing. No. No, we would start around this time. <laughs> yeah. I remember joining and you guys telling me the typical start times. I'm like, oh, really? That's uh, yeah, well, interesting. You guys aren't you guys aren't just joking with me? Okay, so my mornings are shot from here on out. Okay, got it. Correct. Are you double calling him, or did he tell you to call you back? I'm calling Pete. Oh, okay. Why does no one ever want to be on this show? If you called me right now, I'd answer. <laughs> no one wants to answer when we get the cool technology to call people. <laughs> Please leave your... The fuck? Who else can we call? <laughs> Who else can we call? We need another... You want to call Cora? <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> like We need the deciding vote here for Clark's Ketchup MVP. You'd have some feel for it. Um, the problem is, it's it's 11 p.m. now. So, like, people that have real lives and shit are going to be like, dude, what are you calling me for? 11 p.m. on a Wednesday. I mean, we can't, we can't drizzle the ketchup with two votes for Hauk. You one seem vote disgusted for with this pick, Jared. It's just, it's just, 
Uh, Coley texted me. I'm in the Cape in a room with two asleep babies. The ketchup goes to Tanner Houck. Yeah. Let's go. Really the only guy who contributed to both wins and he was nails in game two. Runner up would be uh, Reese Dry Jerks for coming on his windshield. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. Oh, uh, man. Um, Tyler Lasso hardly ruined it. Cut out his internet. Yeah, I saw I'm back, that, baby. Uh, he's back. Uh, all right. So Clark's Ketchup Series MVP. Three votes go to Tanner Howe. Congratulations, your Series MVP. Brought to you by Clark's Ketchup. It is Tanner Howe. <laughs> Tremendous. Uh, absolutely outstanding. Um, breaking news. We have a new sponsor, a late season call up, if you will. CBDMD. Of course, you've heard of CBDMD before. Uh, the leaders in hemp based CBD and Delta 9 THC products. These guys have everything you could possibly need to just straight up feel better. So, their latest breakthrough it's Delta 9 THC. These sneaky innovators found a way to get these Delta 9 THC products shipped directly to your door. Some restrictions may apply because, of course, they do. So check your local laws before purchasing. But I'm telling you, this stuff is the real deal. They have got gummies packed with 10 milligrams of THC, perfect for winding down and watching the socks blow yet another lead. 10 milligrams sounds like a lot. Well, CBDMD has you covered with their microdose soft gels. With just one milligram of THC, these little guys pack a punch that's perfect for all day support whenever and wherever you need it the most. Don't get all caught up in all the technicalities. This is the same THC you've come to know and love over the years, just extracted from hemp. I usually need to wind down at the end of the day. I'm usually like, once we do, it's fucking 11 o'clock at night right now. So I'm just always going, going, going. Last night we did a, uh, the stream until like 11 o'clock at night. Some of these nights, they like the work day doesn't end for me until 12.30, sometimes 1 o'clock in the morning. I got to wind down too. So that's why these CBD MD gummies are perfect for your boy, just like they'll be perfect for you. To learn more about Delta 9 and everything else CBD MD, uh, just head on over to cbdmd.com. It's pretty simple. Once again, that is cbdmd, M is in Massachusetts, dot com for more information, education, and the best damn gummies that you've ever had. You must be 21 years or older to purchase Delta 9. <sighs> um, I feel like that was a that was a meaty podcast. Right about it's 1101, which is almost exactly where I said we were gonna end up. You were gonna get a little bit north of a two-hour podcast. We were gonna get done around 11 p.m. We even what the fuck is that look, Pat? What? What I said, Jake, didn't I say that we were going to get done around 11? I think you said an hour and a half, but also mm -hmm. 11. So the time. So I bad math. Yeah, that I, that I was confused when you said it as well. But what you said is correct. Yeah, I said around I bad math. All right, Pat. Sorry, dude. I'm bad at math. You know, the people that were bad at math in college, fucking English class people like me. I wrote a book. Mm. You can't expect me to be able to do math good. I was a good writer. So therefore, fuck you. I said 11 and it's 11. Oh, you have big fancy plans in your fucking meth lab or whatever the fuck you're doing over there? It might Sandra's way in right behind him. Well, are you guys officially back together? Like you tweeted that you guys broke up. Like, do you have an update on your relationship? You guys seem to be spending a lot of time together and she hasn't told me anything about it. <laughs> well, listen, bad luck. Uh, at this time, I have no comment on my personal life uh but uh you you certainly had a comment on it when you guys broke up so it's interesting that you don't have a comment now that she's just floating around in the fucking background all the time listen <laughs> i don't have a comment at this time uh i thank you for your concern um i'm really concerned i know i know that's what that's what makes us such good friends uh but at this time <laughs> uh i have no comment take notes jaren duran <laughs> yeah <laughs> smart smart um Tyler, do you have any final thoughts as we close the book on this uh, trade deadline episode? Um, 
I think we'll have some fun baseball over the last two months. And I did not think it was going to be that fun when the trade deadline came. I thought there'd be more selling. So I'm happy to have a competitive team. Well, maybe it's not the best for the outlook moving forward. It's good to have something somewhat interesting to talk about instead of a team that's dead and just giving up. Fair. Uh, Pat, any final thoughts? Um, no, not, not, not a whole lot of final thoughts. Um, the one question I do have, and I was going to ask this off air, but I might as well ask it on air since the fans are probably curious themselves. Are we fans staring well, no. down the, ba- the barrel of three podcasts this week? Because we got two in Atlanta, one Baltimore, and then three Yankee. Wait, next week. Next week, yeah. But I just didn't count this weekend as as the uh, as part of it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh. All right. Well, listen. We don't need an answer right now. <laughs> Wait. I I let me pull up the schedule here because I. Uh... It's a two game series against the Braves. Mm-hmm. Oh, all right. Hold on. Wait a minute. Today is the third. Yep. Okay. So you're going to get four games. Yeah. You'll get a podcast on Sunday. So Monday morning, Thursday morning. Yeah. That's normal, right? Well, then there would also yeah. be one on Friday morning. If we did oh, just the, the fucking. Series. Oh, there's a fucking one game. There's a fucking one game against Baltimore on Thursday. Yeah. What are we going to (laughs) do? That's why I'm asking. (laughs) Um, Jake, what do we do? I mean, that's a huge game against a team. You got a leapfrog right now. I feel like that deserves a pod. (laughs) So... (laughs) <laughs> all right let me let me rephrase it to the room pat if we did a podcast sunday wednesday and thursday how many would you be around for oh, would is... you be around would you be around for the the thursday one game series against the orioles podcast let me look right now because uh i have to see because my calendar is filling up quite a bit right now because right, 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 i've right, been right. gone for two and a half weeks and no one <laughs> no one's been able to meet with me mm-hmm. um monday is ashura i can't miss that uh if you look at your G- we're not recording on monday we're recording on sunday wednesday and thursday thursday as it stands right now i will be not there I have a dinner. You're you're busy at fucking ten thirty at night. So it's very dependent on how long dinner goes and what time dinner is. Uh, mm-hmm. I will say I am trying to push for an early dinner for this uh, mm-hmm. and a non-alcoholic dinner because uh, I have a busy Friday, um, uh, a very busy Friday. So uh, there's a chance I'm a, I'm available late, but I just can't promise anything right now, and I would never promise something to the fans that I couldn't deliver on. I mean, you just you just straight up don't want to be a part of history, like the first ever three podcast week that we've ever had. I'll be a part of it. I'm How sure are you going to be a part of it? It look, looks like Wednesday's free, so I'll probably be a part of that podcast. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'll be a Sunday. part of the podcast week, just not all of them. Possibly. Yeah, I think, I think that what I just fucking said, though, is that I wanted you to be a part of all three because we're doing three in the... Like, what does it matter... If we as a show do three, but you're not there for all three, then you're not part of the, the whole three thing. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. Yeah. Do you get that? Mm-hmm. Do so, you follow so, that? So let's, yeah. let's take a look here. It's a 7 10 yeah, game. Let's take a look. <clears throat> yep. 7 10 game. This 7 10 p.m. Eastern. This is going to be such a really busy 48 hours. All right. So 7 10. Ga- se- 7 10. Hey, we're all busy. Yep. Yo, yeah. Well, yep. Jake, Jake, you, Jake, you busy? Super busy. Jake has so much fucking stuff to do, but I guarantee you he'll be sitting right there for this. this Wednesday and Thursday podcast. Tyler has to probably be up at four o'clock in the morning. Tyler, what time you get to wake up? Wrong. You get to wake up before today. Yeah, I'm getting up at four. I'm producing Zolak and Bertrand on my own tomorrow, so I got oh, really early days. Yeah, Damn. big big things coming. You up. You sound pretty fucking Pat, busy, dude. Yeah, Pat. I, I don't know. It, it sounds like you could make it if you really cared. Yeah. Listen. Yeah, I woke up. I woke up this morning. I did. I did touch her and rich this morning. 
Um, I, I also you. did this podcast. I live tweeted the game and I uh, I was on with with Maz. I actually did two shows um, on Sports Hub today. Yesterday, I filmed the show for Nesson and then I'm, I'm actually building the studio here for my MLB Network stuff that I'm going to be doing. And then I got to do the stream. I did the stream last night for four hours. That was for the DraftKings. Um, but no, I can see. No, I, I can see how you're too busy. Mm hmm. I'm glad you, mm-hmm. I'm glad you glad you understand. Yeah, 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 yeah. There, yeah, no, no, I get it. Um, yeah, Jake, Jake literally does the full time job of three people. Uh, Milliken pretty much, I mean, sleeps like four hours a night because he's he's working his ass off. But Pat, Pat has to has to get has to get drinkies, drinky poos. Huh? <laughs> yeah. So we're, that's what we're saying. It's drinky poos. Well, it's. I mean, it's Pat. you'd have a hard time denying that that's the narrative right now. It, it just feels like odd timing when you just won people back over. Yeah, like you're you're like you're like the 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 what's the word uh, the hometown hero right now. Well, listen, I'm confident uh, that I will be there on Sunday. I am confident that I will be there on Wednesday. Um, as far as Thursday is concerned, as it stands right now, there is a chance I will be there. Um, mm-hmm. But I have a, a a dinner meeting that I must attend. Uh, I had a dinner. is it is it to is it to buy the fucking angels? No, it is not. To okay, buy so I'm really struggling to uh, <laughs> gauge the importance of this meeting. Well, most or something that can't can you, you can just cancel or postpone or well, here's the thing: not show up to or I haven't been moved the time of. I haven't been home in in, in over two weeks. Uh, mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. a lot of uh things have been postponed for the last two weeks oh you haven't been home in two weeks we haven't had a three episode week ever which one's more rare we don't do excuses around here pat all right so mm, here, this here's is no excuse podcast here's what we're gonna do this is what we're gonna guys. do, we're gonna do. Guys, this yep. is what we're gonna do listen i'm listening we're friends guys and uh, as much like i said i can guarantee a sunday i can guarantee a wednesday as much as i'd like to guarantee a thursday the, the, mm-hmm. At the end of the day, guys, when it comes to this particular podcast, I'm mm-hmm. all in and I will be there Thursday night after the Baltimore. Wow, Here we look go, at this folks. guy. Look at that. <laughs> hey. <laughs> Pat's in. Pat's in for all three episodes. Next week, we got one uh, Sunday night, which will drop Monday morning. Uh, Wednesday night, which will drop Thursday morning, and then Thursday night to drop on Friday morning. And by the way, you know, I know you're busy. I'm busy. Tyler's busy. That makes Jake even more busy because it's a three podcast week. Uh, also, I, I'm assuming that one of those is going to be ad free, right? Because there's no way the DraftKings knows that we're doing three episodes next week. No, not until I tell them tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let them know tomorrow. And, uh, yeah, just call up, call up the sponsors and be like, "Hey, the guys are doing three pods next week. So if you uh, if you got any of the, those ads, let us know. But if not, I'm I'm hey, I'm so about the people that I'm happy to do an ad free uh, bonus pod for that one game series against the Baltimore Orioles because again, big division. If <laughs> you know what." <laughs> I already know the Red Sox are going to win that game because it's going to be very funny that our claim to this season is that our only win, our only series win against an AL East team all year is going to be a a one game series. So I'm almost guaranteeing a win on Thursday. And that's the only time they're going to win a series against the AL East this year. Bet the house on the Sox. Bet the house. Bet the house on the socks on Thursday because that is the perfect narrative. If I was booking it like it was a storyline, the only time the Red Sox are going to beat an ALEs team this year in a series, it's going to be a series win in a series in which it was only one game. <laughs> All right. Uh, what's today? Today's Wednesday. All right. Uh, we'll be back. On Monday morning at oh, we didn't do the fucking stop and shop. Look at I'll do it quick. I'll do it quick. I know everyone wants to leave. I want to I want to leave. I won't go watch a scary movie. What did uh what did Sandra say to watch, by the way? A a perfect pair. Something like that. That I think you're right. Good job. 
Uh, it's a four game series against Kansas. Stop and shop, look ahead. Brought to you by Stop and shop. Uh, Nick Pavetta versus Chris Boobies. Uh, Josh Winkowski versus Zach Granke. Nathan Avaldi still here versus Daniel Lynch and Cutter Crawford versus Brad Keller. Uh, you miss Brady Singer in this uh, series, which is great because he's probably the best guy that they got. Uh, Chris Boobies, two and six, a 545 ERA, a 160 whip. He sucks. Uh, career 471 ERA, a career FIP of 508. He sucks. He walks a ton of people. Uh, July was his best month. Uh, his FIP was still 480, so he sucks. Uh, Royals are six and eleven when he pitches. One and six in his last seven. Zach Greinke three and six, a four forty one ERA. I'm not going to talk shit about Zach Greinke, but he sucks. Um, July two starts with zero earned runs, two starts with three earned runs, and one start with six earned runs. You just never know what you're going to get with this guy. It's a very mixed bag this season. Uh, the Royals are nine and eight when he starts and have won his last two. Uh, JD has multiple home runs against them. So, uh, I think Hosmer also sees the ball well, two, two doubles and a home run and 32 at bats against him. Daniel Lynch, four and seven, a 470 ERA, a 155 whip and 9.4 strikeouts per nine. Uh, second year starter. Um, he sucks. Is he? <laughs> ZRA is almost five. His ERA is rookie season with 569. Uh, Royals are seven and seven and nine when he starts. Um, they've alternated al- alternated wins and losses over his last six starts. Um, he hasn't faced anyone on the Red Sox ever. Uh, and he sucks. Brad Keller, who I like, he's one of my buddies, but he sucks. <laughs> he's five, five and twelve. Uh, I remember that. He uh, him and Whit Merrifield, this must have been uh, early 2018. It couldn't have been 17. I think it was early 18. Uh, they were in New York playing the Yankees. And I think Keller is like a big barstool guy. Uh, so they they wanted like a tour of the office. So I like gave them a tour of HQ2 uh, like late at night when no one was in there. Brought them in there. Uh, he's a good kid. I like Keller a lot, but he sucks. He is the only qualified starter for the Royals, meaning he is their leader in ERA because no one else qualifies. Uh, his five wins are the most of the team. He leads the American League in losses with 12. Uh, the third time in his five seasons, he has double digit losses. He has, a, he had a 539 ERA last year. Um, he sucks at striking guys out. What's the strikeouts per nine? It is six. That sucks. Uh, the Royals are seven and thirteen when he starts, and then he's lost three straight. Red Sox hitters against Brad Keller, three sixty four with a four fifty one on base, an OPS over a thousand. Um, Bob Verdugo, Fam, Jackie Bogarts, and JD all have an OPS over a thousand against Keller, who again I love. I I say you suck with with love. Um, all right, this is a sweep, right? Everyone's gonna sweep. I'll go three out of four. What? Uh, I, Did you not just hear what I said? I heard everything you said. I just said they suck. I heard I heard what you said. All of them suck. They haven't earned that back to me yet. They haven't earned the... Sw- I'm not giving the them Red the The Red Sox just took a series from the fucking Astros. We were, were drizzling ketchup tonight. And you... This team sucks. It would be the most 2022 Red Sox thing ever to take two out of three from the Astros and get their shit kicked in against... The Royals. I'm not saying that's going to happen. I'll take three out of four. I think there'll be one headache in there. Eric Hosmer returns to Kaufman. Awesome. Have a great day. I think he's going to have a lot of fun and have a big game or two while he's over there. Jake? Yeah, this team fucking sucks. That's an easy sweep. (laughs) (laughs) Pat? Get the brooms out. We're sweeping. Yeah! You guys are cowards. No, you're a coward for not having the balls to predict a sweep because this is the easiest four game sweep Jerry, of the entire Jerry, season. You had the them Royals getting swept against suck. the Astros. You had them getting swept against the Astros. Don't give me any of and that it shit. Worked. It worked. It worked. I don't want to hear that bullshit. You said they were going to get swept. They won the series. Yeah. yeah. Because I they- jinxed it. Oh, spare me. Please spare me. You don't, Milliken. I'm I telling you right reality. now. Um, yeah, you you live too much in reality because you don't know how to work jinxes. And I'm telling you right now, if if the Red Sox don't sweep the Royals in four games, 
I'm gonna uh I'll tell I'll tell you on the next episode what I'm gonna do. Okay. Uh, listen, I'm hoping for a sweep. I'm not fighting against it. Yeah, well, it sounds like you're not really rooting for it. I, I, I'm rooting very hard for it. Okay. Harder than you can what, imagine. What game are they going to lose? Because um, everyone that's pitching sucks. If you didn't hear that correctly. No, I, I did hear you. The Josh Winkowski game worries me a little bit. I think anything can go weird. Nick Pavetta has been a little up and down lately. Um, <sighs> but, I, you know, I wouldn't really throw it on the starters. I could see the bullpen giving it up as well. Um, we'll see. Fantastic. I don't know. I, Yes, they, they have been good. Not for a majority of the season, but the, they were good in the Houston series. You, you, you think that now's they the time in. that they're going to shit the bed against the fucking against the fucking Royals? I think anything's possible with the 2022 Red Sox. Okay. For Listen, your I, sake, I just... I'm jinxing I, it. I'm jinxing it. I want the sweep. I don't think you know how jinxes work. I just made it work. Pretty much the Yankees have like a losing record since I said that they were going to break the fucking Mariners. So aren't you jinxing record. them by saying the Red Sox are going to sweep? No. Okay. I can turn it on and off. So can I. <laughs> <laughs> oh. All right. Uh, I guess we'll find out. I guess we'll find out in episode one of three next week. And you know what, Pat? Because... You're, you're being a, an A-plus teammate and clubhouse guy. I will promise you I will keep the episodes to under two hours. Thank you. <laughs> Are you saying that because you don't believe me? <laughs> this is the trade deadline episode. We had a lot to t- and We had to get in the Robbie Scott and there was Robbie Scott and there was the trade deadline. There was the Houston Astros series. There was... There's a lot of stuff that we had to cover. I, we had to cover the Pat Light audio. Which again, should we listen to that again? No. I think we should end with that. Yeah, we should end with that. Okay. Uh, Jake's takes. Do you have any final thoughts before we, before we end on this? No, I just can't wait to hear the audio again. <laughs> <laughs> Jose Barrios. Steven Piscotti. Mitch Hanniger, Joey Gallo, Lance McCullers, who's in the minor leagues today doing a rehab. Matt Olson. That is absolutely absurd. Patrick Wisdom. Here's another foul ball by Sanchez, and it's 0-2. Jesse Winker. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what was going, in the right? water in 2012? And, of course, the Red Sox in that year not only took Devin Marrero, but Pat Light and Brian <laughs> Johnson. So in a talent-rich draft... P.U. I'd have to say the Red Sox did not take advantage. O2. O2. All right. Well, we'll see you on Monday. Buenas noches, amigos.